Excellent. Well, thanks for swinging by, man. How you been? I've been really good. I'm so happy to be here. I just, I just, I really love what you're doing and I love what you've been doing with your podcasts and uh, all of the guests that you've had before. I was listening to almost every single one of them on the way over here. Cause oh, really? I'm, thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for making it in the bad weather. <laughs> you're very welcome. But I just really believe in what you're doing and uh, bringing, you know, this level of cult culture and arts to uh, regular day conversation. Yeah, it's it's nice, you know, like, again, traveling the world for like 25 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, having all these experiences all, all over the place and then being able to come back here and share it with other creative people and other people who are doing, you know, f amazing things in their life. It's uh, it's been nice. Yeah. And we have such a shared journey, both being Canadian, mm -hmm. right, then going abroad yeah. and then coming back. And here we are. Yeah. Yeah. I really want to get into like where you grew up and stuff like that, because sure. Vancouver is amazing and I've always loved going out there. But. I was from the other side, the colder side. Right. Try. I grew up in Toronto. Yeah. Well, I lived and worked in Montreal for many years, so okay. I'm somewhat familiar. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, how's your how's your year been so far? We're just kind of getting into 2024. Is there any kind of like, is it going well? Is it not going well? Like, wh how can you describe what's going on in this world? Well, exactly. <laughs> how can you describe what's going on in this world right now? Because yeah. we're all just kind of licking our wounds from COVID and being shut down. And we're like just starting to realize, oh, like I have a bunch of mental health issues from being locked down for two years that I actually need to deal with. Yeah. Right? And this is part of my therapy, by the way. Like it just, yeah, I mean, I just love having these conversations and being able to chat with people and learn a little yeah. bit about their lives and obviously expand my own knowledge base. Right. So I find th these incredibly therapeutic. Yeah. And where, where I am now in my life is that I am in real estate, at least that's what the IRS believes. <laughs> but I'm trying not to be, yeah. but I am. Yeah. And so 2023, the real estate market was just really pretty dead. Mm -hmm. And so that was a bit of a struggle and I've changed offices and stuff. So I think a lot of people felt like 2024 was like, okay, this is the one where I got my feet under me now, yeah. right? And I can actually start to go out and I have enough mental bandwidth to start to actually accomplish life again. Yeah, it's been a lot of like um, sheltering in place, right? It's been a lot of like treading water. We have, yeah. it's been really hard to kind of advance because, right. as, as you know, especially um, we've also had the writer's strike and the actor's right. strike and it's just been slow, hasn't it? Well, it's been slow chaos mm. and that's the painful part because you're sitting with yourself in the slower times of life in and amongst all of this chaos and whether that's you know january 6th or whether that's the COVID or what like there's just all these things that you're just sitting at home going okay like oh this is really different are we okay are we gonna be okay like the world is it feels a little bit like everyone's trying to carry on as if everything is normal but nothing is uh, nothing is no right. and of course we have november coming soon so we have a, another potential shit show for our friends who are Americans. I don't know if you are, are, do you vote. Do you have a U.S. passport or I do. So okay. I was actually born in uh, Tacoma, Tacoma, Washington. Oh, okay. Um, when my parents were going to um, seminary school, mm -hmm. so they met, um, fell in love, um, and then moved back to Vancouver. Okay, yeah. that's great. So you had a pure Canadian Vancouver upbringing from the time I was two to the time I was sixteen. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what was it like growing up in Vancouver? Because we're probably about the same age, so it would have been like 80s, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so growing up in Vancouver is very interesting, and I wouldn't have traded it for anything for a couple of reasons. The first being just the time in which I was alive. I got to grow up in the 70s and 80s, right, where we didn't have a lot of the advances in technology that we have today, but that also like lent us to a different world. And so it was good. I mean, my, my father was a Baptist minister at the local church and my mom was a substitute school teacher. It was very, you know, it was very average, very normal, very trying to be wholesome, but having a very dark side. <laughs> That's always the fun part, isn't it? Yeah. When people think you're, uh, you're wholesome, but you have the darkness inside yeah. you for sure. Yeah. But um, I always like growing up in Canada in the 80s was just super relaxed. Like it was before technology right. took over our lives. Right. It was all about, you know, for me, it was, you know, watching hockey with my family yeah. you know, on the weekends or, or on the evenings and uh, and playing sports and stuff like that. But it was just like I just feel like everything was like super safe and everything was just super chill. And we never thought about crime or any like there was just it wasn't part of our consciousness and it was before mass shootings and. You know, you're right. It was just a really relaxed time where you could just be safe and feel safe on the streets. Yeah. And it seemed like the international world was also a little bit calmer. 
back in the day? Yes, for sure. And I actually, so when you were heading to China and heading out of North America, I was heading from Canada to the U.S. Okay, so around, around uh, 2000, 2001. That... Well, actually, it was a little bit before that. 93 is when I moved to America. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. yeah. And I was still in high school then. I, I, moved, uh, I moved out to China when I graduated from university in 2001. Yeah, that was my that was my stint. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So what? So so you moved to the U.S. at sixteen? Yeah. Well, I actually I moved out of my parents' home at sixteen, and I moved to Winnipeg because I was a student with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet School for many years. Oh, hold on, you got to take a step back. So 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 what were what were you what were you doing living in Vancouver? How did you get into ballet school? When, what, like when did this whole dancing thing yeah. uh, come come about? Yeah. So I was kind of a interesting child in that I, I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. You know, I was like just super gay, right? And just not, you know, it was late 70s, early 80s, you know, I, there just wasn't really a place for me. And I didn't, I wasn't rough and tumble kind of boy. I was, you know, enjoyed hand sewing in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it, was, so it was tough to find friends to do that with. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so um, the compromise was that they, my parents wanted me to do something physical because mm -hmm. I was kind of overweight. And so the compromise was tap dancing. <clears throat> okay, well, that's not bad. I mean, yeah. if you're not going to play hockey, if you're going to be a Canadian and yeah. not play hockey, tap yeah. dancing is the obvious that's alternative. Yeah. Yeah. That was the clear path forward for me at 10 years old. Okay, <laughs> that's good. So that's how that started. And then, you know, just a few years later, I started adding in other things like ballet and jazz and then by the time I was 16, that's when I auditioned for the Royal. Amazing. So, um, like growing up in Vancouver, like were there like a lot of schools where you could learn how to dance? Like, was this something that your family had done? Like, was your mother or father a dancer as well? Like, or did you just come into this totally on your own? Totally on my own. And it was a huge problem <laughs> because, you know, my, my father was the head of the Baptist church locally, you know, and my mom was a substitute school teacher. And they just didn't know what to do with me, right. you know, because I was just, you know. Because you didn't play hockey and you didn't, you know. yeah. I mean, they're like, what do we do with this kid? You know, because he doesn't seem to, like, identify in any of the boxes that we know. Right. So I was kind of just out on my own, finding my own way. Um, my parents didn't hold me back. Um, and they definitely paid and facilitated for a lot of doors to be opened for me. But at the same time, there was this tension because me being in ballet back then mm -hmm. was a real problem to the point where my local family doctor got involved oh really yeah wow that's kind of in so walk me through that like obviously because because your father is a baptist church minister right um was there any conflict between his faith and the church and and your upbringing or well i think it was just more that my father was i don't know if he was embarrassed or he just he just wasn't really down with his son being in ballet right, right. and so again he didn't stand in my way but there wasn't really a lot of like oh yeah he's like good grand jeté you like <laughs> yeah they just didn't they didn't know what to do with that right so cuz most kids just grow up playing hockey right yeah so what do you do with a kid that wants to be in the ballet yeah yeah as a little boy yeah. who wants to be in ballet like so anyways it, it created some tension but again i applaud my parents for not saying i couldn't do it um and they were kind of curious just to kind of watch to see how far i'd take it mm -hmm. but i took it all the way and they weren't kind of expecting that you know to the point where my local teacher and my parents pulled me into a meeting to tell me to stop and i said no to stop doing ballet yeah okay because there was no path forward for me that they could see but i could yeah and back at that i mean that's before the internet like you know like that's before like websites yeah. and stuff like that like sure how did you know that if you take this ballet class you can audition for this ballet school and blah blah like how do you even figure that out at that age right so at 10 years old i started taking tap at this one dance school by the time i was 12 and 13 i was adding ballet and stuff to my daily routine right but kids were also going to competitions and being picked up by the big schools and being moved away from their families to these professional dance schools and that and that seemed like something you wanted not wanted had to have i had to leave my parents home i knew i wasn't safe there yeah you know and i it was the only path and it would really like pushed me to push myself to become a better dancer because it was my clear path for, forward to not only get away from my parents but also to be in an environment where i was understood yeah 
Yeah, no, that's cra- crazy. What was, I mean, what was it like growing up for you in Vancouver in the 80s when, you know, being different, being gay, like that wasn't talked about right. at all. Like right. I remember in Toronto, in Canada, like I I grew up with kids and no one ever even talked about the, that subject. Right. And we didn't identify with that at all. Like we've come so, so far in so many ways, but I mean, it must've been really hard. Like, did you even know like what was going on with you at that time? I was pretty clear on what was going on with me. What I wasn't clear was the rules that were around me. I didn't understand them, like literally to the point where it came time for me to write my book and I called it foreign to me because I don't understand like this craziness that's built up on nothing that means nothing and that is punitive, Mm -hmm. right? And so um, it was tough because again, like my parents sat me down with my local family doctor because I had to get a bill of health in order to go to the professional ballet school. So my local doctor was involved. Mm -hmm. And after they had that conversation, my mother just broke down crying um, because my doctor told my mother, well, you know what happens at those places, right? (laughs) At like, at at premier ballet schools. (laughs) Yes, apparently, apparently, (laughs) right? So there was just like all of this bigotry that was being (laughs) layered on top of that that was created out of nothing Mm -hmm. with no actual proof right but it created again more tension but they might again my parents did let me go but uh, there were several times where i was sat down and talked to about so i knew that i wasn't safe to come out until i was financially independent that was really clear to me and i'm so glad that i did because my coming out from my parents was a nightmare (laughs) That's interesting, though. So at 16, like, where you're already ready, I mean, you're already in this mental state of having tension with your parents no matter what, right? whether you're straight or gay, yeah. you know, what doesn't matter what you are, mm-hmm. you're already ready for a fight, like, yeah. that you're trying to find your own identity. And then here you are, like, having them hold this ballet school opportunity over your head. Over me. Yeah, yeah. that's fucking I'll terrifying. Nev- I'll never forget the day they sent me out to mow the backyard. And during that time, they were having the conversation as to whether they were going to actually send me to the Royal Winnipeg Ballet or not. While you were mowing the lawn. While I was mowing the lawn. And I will never forget. Did they include you in the conversation no. or did they just leave you out in the back? They told me to go mow the lawn while they decided. <laughs> Before they decided for you yeah. without including you in the conversation. 100%. Boy, parenting has changed a little bit, hasn't it? Well, it's like your conversation you had with that gymnast in how it was so toxic back then. Yeah. And so as toxic as gymnastics was back in the 80s, so was ballet. Oh, I can imagine. It must, I mean, gymnastics is still toxic today. I mean, they're yeah. still having all these problems with the women's uh, uh, US team I've read recently. Yeah. Like one of the coaches got a little handsy or something like that. Yeah. yeah. No, the abuse in the ballet world. But again, this was, you know, this was the 80s. We were 16 and we were, you know, sustaining ourselves on cigarettes and coffee. like. It was just a different world back then. You know what I mean? Like everybody smoked Mm -hmm. and like we all just drank coffee and just went from class to class. And that was our teenage life. Yeah. Right. But things were so much easier. They so much were in a way because like you were just kind of left to do your own thing and nobody really cared. Whereas today everybody cares. Like their ego is so involved in caring that it's like it's hard to actually get things to move quickly now in life. Yeah. It's true because so many people have an opinion. Nothing moves fast anymore, but no. except for information and misinformation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 16 and you haven't come out gay yet to your family, but you got this chance to go to Winnipeg and then you went. Yes. And how was that? Amazing. Yeah. I mean. Because Winni- Winnipeg's a tough town. I've been there many times. Winnipeg is not okay. an easy place to live. So Winnipeg's has both the worst winters and the worst summers. So you get like this three week period between the two where, you know, like it's actually okay, but you're right. I mean. I remember it being minus 40 and taking the bus to school for weeks. Now we have to explain this to Americans. Okay. Minus 40 Celsius is also the same as minus 40 Fahrenheit. Right. That's where the two, that's, that's where they two cross over. That's so minus, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it appeals to both audiences. It, it, appeals, to, it appeals to all audiences. That's yeah. good. Because I've been using Celsius because I've been abroad forever, right? right. So you know, coming here. But yeah, so minus 40 in Winnipeg is like a normal day. Normal day. And I remember it was minus 40 for three weeks once, and it finally came up to zero, you know, or 32. Yeah. And I remember it being so balmy that I took my jacket off. Like, it was so warm out because it had been minus 40 for so long. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. 
and uh and obviously like winnipeg has a big native american population and yeah. sometimes there's some friction there as well like i remember being there at a time when there was a lot of homelessness and things like that and yeah so i mean there's it's definitely a, a winnipeg's kind of like obviously it's almost geographically right in the middle of canada right uh quite close to the southern u.s border for anyone that doesn't know the geography but it, it it's um yeah it's it's much different than life in vancouver yeah, and life in north Toronto. Of north Dakota. North of North Dakota. Five hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a fun place. I used to go to, um, we used to play basketball tournaments. I played for the University of Toronto basketball. And um, we used to play basketball uh, tournaments at Brandon in Manitoba, which is west of Winnipeg right. by like an hour or two. Yeah, I remember that back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good old Winnipeg. Anyhow, I got out of there, and then I went to Montreal <clears throat> after Winnipeg. How many? So, how many years in Winnipeg were you? Three. Okay. And yeah. what was the training like there? Because I mean, you you'd think like the best ballet schools would be in Toronto or Vancouver, but so what was like the ballet school like in the middle of the country? Yeah. So there's really two places for well, maybe three for the best ballet in Canada, and that's Winnipeg, Montreal, and Toronto, right? Yeah. And each one has a, the most prestigious school like in the world, and because. Canada really supports its arts, always has, right? right? And uh, that's interesting, though. I mean, like most people probably wouldn't think that Canada has some of the best ballet schools in the world. They do. Yeah. They absolutely do. Huh. So I went to the one in Winnipeg, and the training, like we talked about a little bit earlier, was abusive. I mean, there uh, there were days. I mean, I I would just wake up in the morning and just cry because I I knew what my day was going to look like for the next eight hours of jumping up and down. And we were being led by people who weren't very conscious. Um, we were often tortured with hat pins and the like oh, man. to get our legs to go higher. Or we were, you know, I mean, just verbally, the, the verbal abuse was so um, intense. But, you know, I had come from a family that existed in the world of verbal abuse so it was kind of like normal to me mm -hmm. and that's why i think i actually fit in and did so well because i was just like i was like oh this is normal me tell if someone telling me that you know i'm never gonna amount to anything mm -hmm. is normal for me i know how to in it, it survive in that environment right is um so i played a lot of sports when i was a kid and uh obviously i've taken a fair share of verbal abuse over the years as well and i always kind of like i always kind of um deciphered it kind of into two piles not yeah um one is like you know where people they want you to be better and they don't know how to get you there so they're frustrated and then they throw verbal abuse or physical abuse at you and then the other is just they're shitty at what they do right and they're and they don't know how to deal with you at all right. and they just and that's just their defensive reaction because they're right. covering up their own insecurities as a coach or as a trainer or as an instructor so like where would you say it was at, in Winnipeg at that time? Like, were they just being abusive for the hell of it because they were, you know, they didn't know what they were doing or where they were being abusive because they, that was like the key to making you the best in the world? More the latter. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of Russian training and we had a lot of Russian teachers. Um, and it's just a different mindset um, of you grind until you either break or get better. Yeah. <laughs> Those are your options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's terrifying. It's terrifying, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's not really a safe, but at the same time. Was there women there too? Was it co-ed? It was co-ed. So it was probably mm, mostly, well, it was almost 50-50 with maybe a little bit more heavy on the women's side because mm -hmm. just guys in ballet are harder to find, especially good ones that they'll accept to the school. Mm -hmm. They try and make it 50-50 so that like in partnering classes and everything, every guy has a girl and vice versa. So. Okay. That's interesting because, I mean, I'm totally ignorant to this whole space. Like, I mean... I've seen the Nutcracker. Yeah, and I mean, actually, I've seen the Nutcracker in Toronto, Canada, and I've I've also seen the Nutcracker, um, in in Moscow. Uh, yeah, wow. a, 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 at the Kremlin. Uh, back before all of this war, um, shit happened, uh, when going to Moscow was acceptable. Um, but yeah, I used to love going to Russia. I filmed an episode there and um, climbed Mount Elbrus, which was the highest mountain there. But I remember seeing the Nutcracker. Actually, that was January twenty twenty, just before COVID. Wow. When I went to the Nutcracker in Moscow, that was an uh, amazing experience. But again, their ballet performances were are are were and are spectacular. Yeah. Wow. So you were part of this whole space, and and so when you go to this school in Winnipeg, I mean, you leave your family from Vancouver, which was a good place for you to be away from them. It sounds like, and then and then you're at this school. Was the school like? Were you, were you feeling isolated there or was that like your community? Like, did you feel like that was going to be your new home? 
it was my definitely my new community because we were you know like an island of safety for ourselves right all these kids who had been brought in from around the country to winnipeg and then tortured <laughs> like you you develop really close intense relationships yeah and uh when you're all going through something yeah. like really fucked up like that exactly yeah. it's kind of the survivor mentality and so we really became a family um but then once i graduated they shipped me off to Montreal, not even asking me if I wanted to go, <laughs> which was fine. So you, so you, so you graduate, you, so you graduate this school in Winnipeg. So you make it like yeah. you, you, I'm now a professional, you, you're a professional. And then they're just like, oh, you're going to Montreal because there's jobs there. Right. So okay. they had, um, a job opening for an apprentice with Le Grand Ballet Canadien in Montreal. And so they pulled me into the office. They're like, there's this job position. Do you want it? We think you should go. You're not getting a job here. What do you want to do? And you have two days to go. So, um, so work, so to, to be a professional in ballet, uh, you would, in, if you had stayed in Winnipeg, you would have worked at the school as an instructor or you would have been so doing goal, performances in Winnipeg. Yeah. The goal of graduating from the Royal Winnipeg Ballet Professional School is to then get a job with a company, right? And so I, if that they will take whoever they like the most from their own school. And then, you know, if you're not picked up by, from the school into the company, you have to go find work elsewhere, hopefully in a company, to go and teach would be seen as a failure. Right. And Toronto and Montreal and Winnipeg were the three epicenters of this space. So right. you needed to be in one of those places if you wanted to further your career. Correct. And they basically handed me a job. It was just, you know, halfway across the country and I needed to leave in two days. So, But fuck, Montreal's a fun town. <laughs> Not a lot of people know how fun Montreal is. Yeah, yeah. And I was there early 90s, right? Yeah. It was just, it was kind of crazy. Oh my gosh. It was such a culture shock to be yeah. there. And to be coming of age, like to be 18, to be 19, yeah. to be 20, like figuring yourself out and to be in Montreal yeah. would have been a wild one. Oh, it was great. And we toured so much. Um, we I'll just ask you to keep. Oh, yeah, sure. Perfect. Sure. Yeah. The, um, the first year, our season was 54 weeks long. Most ballet company seasons are six to eight months long. But our first one, because of our touring schedule, was a year and two weeks Okay, so hold, walk me through what that even means. I'm 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 totally lost. So your season, like yeah. So so you you pick up play, like you pick up performance to do. You train it, mm -hmm. and then you take it on the road, or you just stay in Montreal and perform it. Right. And and then yeah, what happens to that? Most season starts around August, and then you have from August to about October to learn the entire year's worth of ballets, all of them including a nutcracker. So multiple ballets you have to have in your head at any time to, to yes. just flip a switch. Right. And and how how sorry, how long do you know in preparation before you have to perform one of those? Is it like in the morning it's like okay guys, today at 5 p.m. we got 5 and 7 p.m. we got two shows tonight and we're doing the nutcracker. Yep. We haven't practiced it in a few months, but you all know it. Yep. Good luck. Well, it's all scheduled ahead of time, so you know what you have to rehearse. And, and the company is really good at keeping you rehearsed for the upcoming weekend. Or oh, that's good. Okay. So, yeah. yeah they'll, they'll keep you on top of it. It's not like, okay, <laughs> here we go. Yeah. Well, I haven't done that for four years. I can't remember those moves, right? I, that would be my fear because I can't remember anything. Yeah. Yeah. So it was... Uh, it was challenging, but the, the touring was great, and that's what I really loved about it. The first, uh, I did two years with Le Grand Ballet Canadien um, before I left that company, but uh, I've danced with seven different ballet companies over the course of 18 years. Amazing, amazing. So uh, where did you get to go with, with Montreal? Like, where did they take you around the world? Where have you performed? Yeah, the first big tour was North America, mm -hmm. and so we did all of Canada and the United States, and then the next big tour was would, Asia. Would, would those have just been like big cities like New York, Chicago, L.A., or like did you go to any like small places or any like out of the out of the way places that would have been interesting? All the above. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, everything. Yeah, <laughs> you know, one night you're at the Joyce in New York, and then the next night you're in somewhere in Ohio, you know, performing in a high school gymnasium. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not kidding. Oh like, wow! If, so you were all over the place. They were booking us whatever they would sell <laughs> wherever they could make a buck yeah. they were throwing you guys sometimes you'd be on the bus for three days in a row and then you'd get off the bus and the next day you'd have to perform how do you do that <laughs> just sitting there broken right like that's awful it, it it's very challenging yeah yeah tour life as a ballet dancer is very challenging on the body but i was young i really enjoyed it i had great friends at the time so yeah i remember uh I remember I like with basketball we would go from Toronto up to Montreal mm -hmm. and uh, we would take the bus up and 
that's like a five or six hour drive, I think. And uh, I remember, yeah, just being so stiff and in, 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 in pain after a six hour bus ride. But then like I was only 6'2", and I had guys on my team that were like 6'10", you know, and how did they squeeze into those little seats and, and manage it? But then, oh man, we play games against like McGill and Concordia and then go out afterwards. And it was, Montreal was a great, great town. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I love living there. If you haven't had poutine at like 3 a.m. after a whole night of drinks, you haven't you haven't lived. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that was the best. <laughs> those were those were some good good days for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. So where did you go after Montreal? After Montreal, I went to Ottawa. I did a short stint there. We did a, a the film of the Tin Soldier. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that play. So I was the strong man in the Tin Soldier. Um, that was the first like. Um, you know, IMDB credits. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was good. And I, so I did a short stint there in Ottawa and then I was picked up by Ottawa, uh, excuse me, by Alabama ballet. And so I moved to Alabama for eight months. And then from there I went to Florida. I danced there for a while. Then I went to Seattle, danced with Pacific Northwest ballet. And then I kind of was tired of ballet and that's when, um, Celine picked me up and I started dancing for her. Okay. We got to That's Celine Dion, by the way, but we got to get into this. Um, the famous Canadian yes. singer, uh, vocalist. Um, so what was it like moving from Canada doing ballet to moving to the United States? Because like Montreal, Ottawa, you know, yeah, you have one idea, right. or at least I do. And then going down to Alabama, you know, how, how welcoming was that experience? Again, it was a huge culture shock because I'd only ever been in Canada, right? So then to go from Canada to like the deep south, the deep, deep south, what was the most funny is my sister came to visit me. By the way, my sister started Lululemon, that company, the yoga wear. Your sister started Lululemon. Yeah. So that's she's the founder. Yeah. She's one of the 10 founding members. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. So yeah. She, anyways, but she I came down. Well, that's why I said it. I have a lot of, I got a lot of Lululemon stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so she comes down to visit me. Um, in Alabama and she couldn't understand like the people because she'd never been around Southerners yeah. and especially, you know, like black Southerners who had like, she could not under, I had to translate for her like the whole, it was hilarious. She that could Southern not, draw, she just couldn't she, pick it up? No, no, she couldn't, but she's very Canadian. Like her Canadian accent is super thick. <laughs> People don't really know what that super thick Canadian accent I know. sounds like, but it's there, yeah. I always think of this super thick Canadian accent to be East Coast, like New Brunswick, PEI. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Newfoundland, yeah, I spent a lot of time out there. That's where the that's where that hardcore Canadian <laughs> accent comes from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was uh, I, that was very distinct. I remember she's like, what are they saying? I said, they said Merry Christmas. She's like, I, how? <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, Alabama! That is the deep South. Yeah, yeah. amazing though. Um, and what? And what? So, what was it like, kind of um, being all around the United States? Because obviously, like, I always find the United States to be the United States for so many people is like enough. Right. Like, there's enough variation in the cities. You have right. Miami, New York, Chicago, L.A. Sure. All totally different. It's big enough. The landscape is yeah. all different. Like, you can live a whole life never leaving the United States. Right. So, what was it like, kind of traveling around and having all these different ballet experiences? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, like like I used to say in performing, like all the glamour is on the other side of the curtain. Y you know what I mean? It was a lot of grind. It was a lot of bus trips. In injuries? You know, um, kind of, yes. Um, I I danced an entire season with a broken shin. Oh, shit. That sounds terrible. It was. <laughs> oh, man. Because, yeah, because, I mean, athletes play injured all the time, yeah. right? And your, I mean, your body would be as fit as any athlete on the planet yeah. as a professional ballet dancer. I yeah. mean, you, I we, mean. We would literally be jumping up and down eight hours a day. I mean, we'd have an hour for lunch, obviously, but our, we we start class at nine in the morning and we would do class and the rehearsals, then lunch, then more rehearsals, you know, a whole eight hour day, but dancing yeah and it's and that's 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 the grind isn't it oh yeah yeah for sure and was it i mean was it well paid at, at that age like could you have gone out and gotten like a a job that would have paid more than being a ballet like were you i guess what i'm trying to get at is were you financially disadvantaged by wanting to be a f ballet dancer versus what your peer group in high school would have gone on to do 100 percent. yeah oh, i mean we were barely making a couple hundred a, a week that's ridiculous isn't it yeah i mean it really was we were like just enough to survive, but that was about it. Yeah, yeah. It was it was pretty. I remember most of my life, I made twenty three thousand a year. 
yeah. as a as a performer. That was my that's income. crazy. Yeah. yeah, doesn't make any sense, does it? When you're working that hard and you have no, there's no time to, for a side hustle. No, nope. there's no time. There's no energy for anything because you're just crippled right. with exhaustion at exactly. the end of each day. And no, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah. So it was very, you know, kind of a pigeonhole. And when I stopped performing. It was actually a real like moment for me to walk into an office and not know how to send a fax. Now I know I'm dating. Well, we just dated ourselves there, yeah. But like that was my experience of, and it was probably the same for you when you left playing sports and you weren't, you know, going on. Then what do you do with all this? I felt the same way leaving performing and then moving into real estate. Yeah, no, I mean, um, so when I, so I had played basketball from like the age of six or seven to the age of 22 and it had been my whole life. Right. And uh, my father was an Olympian. So, um, he played, he represented Canada in 1972. So like he always brought this kind of like sports, listen to your coaches, you know, be on time kind of mentality to everything that we did, which I'm very thankful for because it just made me quite disciplined in everything I do in my life. But, um, but when I finished playing basketball in, 2001 I was 22 years old I wasn't good enough to play for the Canadian national team which was a dream and I wasn't good enough to play professionally uh, which was another dream like it was devastating because your whole identity is wrapped up in being a great basketball player at that age level in that space right and all I wanted to do was take myself out of that space and be somewhere else completely and I just went to China yeah. like that was a that was a complete reaction to me needing to like find another identity for myself right. as quickly as possible. Right. Yeah. Because I didn't want to be the guy who hung around who talks about the good old days all the time. Because that just would have broken my heart. Yeah. I was the same way. I wanted to leave. And so I, I left performing after my gig with Celine um, in Vegas. I was like, okay, I was going through the same thing. Like, who am I now that I'm not performing? Because I didn't want to be 50 years old and still auditioning. And I see so many of my friends are in that how do they how do they keep up the fitness at 50 to be able to dance professionally like i can't i couldn't imagine training the same way i did when i was 20 today right. i'd break i'd break everything yeah. yeah and i just have a lot of friends who never got their dreams satisfied and they're still chasing it like into their later years and i just i was so grateful that i did it i did it to death i did it to the point where i didn't want to do it anymore and i i left satisfied that i had done everything that i had set out to do in my performing career well, that's incredibly healthy, right? Because how many people can actually say that? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like maybe Roger Federer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so did you retire from the Seattle dance company to then join Celine? Like how did that, how did you actually end up meeting Celine or her team and being brought into her world? Because sure. this is, because I mean, she's a massive star. Massive. Like, like the biggest. Yeah. yeah. Like how did you even make this leap from, you know, s s um, struggling, grinding with these ballet companies to then becoming like, you know, working with Celine in her Las Vegas residency. Yeah. So it was kind of a interesting journey in that I knew I didn't want to do ballet anymore. It was just too hard, you know, and it was just such a grind and the precision just had to be so precise. Um, whereas like in the Broadway world, you can be a little bit more sloppy and messy. It's not about precision. It's about the emotion. It's about the show. Like it's about a lot of other things, but it's not, oh, your, your fourth finger is in the wrong place when you're doing this really tricky thing in the air. They're that specific with, oh, with yeah. the, the commentary about your yeah. performance. Yes. It's like ice skating. You know, and they, they, everything is adjudicated. Really? Everything. Yeah, I love Broadway because it's it feels much looser. It is. Yeah, right? and more it's, fun. You feel like the people are having fun and you're having fun and exactly. it's like everyone's having fun. Right. <laughs> and having started in tap way back in the day, right, yeah. right I kind of dusted off some of those skills and I started singing and I started like just doing things that I could kind of move in that direction. Um, there was a teaching opportunity for Anne Ryan King, who was Bob Fosse's wife for many years. And so anyways, she had a um, Broadway summer camp that I had the opportunity to go and teach at. And um, the day before the big performance of Anne Ryan King's summer camp, the lead breaks his foot. Interesting. So, so you went from being a professional ballet dancer to then, and this was after you had retired, you went to this Broadway summer camp? It was, um, yeah, it was kind of because again, ballet seasonal. So in the summer, you have time to go do whatever you want. Oh, so the, so and okay. So then you went to New York and did this like Broadway s right. summer camp. Right. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. So then the lead breaks his foot, and I get put in. And but you're an instructor. Yes. 
and just the, but the lead would have been a student. Student. Correct. Okay, so right. you so you got demoted, but you got to be the lead. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And so, you know, after all, six weeks of this uh, summer camp, comes to the big show. It's a big Broadway theater, you know, extravaganza. They're doing hair, you know, right? And so anyways, the lead... Do you remember which, do you remember which theater it was? Sorry to interrupt you. I just, I love Broadway. I go like all the time. I, I, I don't, don't remember. No. Yeah. It's it's such a grind down there. Yeah. It? So that was about 2002 when I did that. And uh, so anyways, that's when I really had the opportunity. Oh, this is a crazy story. Um, so after the show, um, the woman who did, uh, sound of music, what's her name? Um, Julie, Julie Andrews. Yeah. Julie right. Andrews. So Julie Andrews is there at the show watching you perform. Yeah. The lead. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> so after the show, um, and, and after the show, like I brought the house down, like, like people just were going bananas. I mean, it was just, but of course it was a student body and all the students and their parents. And so it was almost more like a sports arena kind of environment that it was a normal arts performance. Right. right. And you were, and you're an instructor at this stage. So you probably brought a whole lot more influences into that performance than just a student who was learning just to train and right. do that one thing. Right. And that's interesting. Yeah. So after the show, Julie and no, and Ryan King brings Julie Andrews over to me. <laughs> this is like, oh, it was one of the best moments and one of the worst moments of my entire life. All right. So they come over next to me and Julie Andrews says to me, she goes, you really are very good, you know. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, stupid me, you know, I, I hear that. And what do I think of? Of course, I think of the line from Cabaret where the guy goes up to Liza after the show and he tells Liza, you really are very good, you know. And she goes, yes, I know. Isn't it fabulous? And you, <laughs> and you throw that back at her. And, and she doesn't laugh. No. Did she, she didn't catch the, she didn't catch the, no, no. Yeah. no. So they're both just kind of staring at me like, you're a little odd fellow, aren't you? <laughs> I, you'd be like, it was in that movie with Liza. Yeah, oh, yeah. Liza. <laughs> Anyways, it was, uh, that was a moment I won't soon forget. But how, but how did that pro propel your career? Like, where did that take you next? I sure. think that's, that's the, that's because I just, I don't know how people move around in this industry right. at all. Like yeah. it just, it doesn't make any sense to me how people get hired and fired and brought on for other projects and where you even find professional right. dancers like this. It's so much like anything. It's networking really a lot. So having done that and having now performed in front of Anne Reinking, you know, herself, who was Bob Fosse's wife, mm -hmm. she then put me into the Broadway show Fosse. Oh my God, that's amazing. So that's how I got that gig, mm -hmm. right? And so I did Fosse on tour uh, for uh, until the tour ended. And then after that, oh, while we were on tour, a bunch of dancers from that show were flying out to Vegas for to audition for Celine's gig. Interesting. So Celine is a worldwide phenomenon, and she was traveling the world for years performing, and then she takes up a re Vegas residency, and she what needs background dancers, like dancers to help her with the show, basically. I never saw her in Vegas, actually. Okay. Yeah. So what she did is she actually approached Franco Dragon, who is the artistic director who did a lot of the Cirque, shows. Yes. Cirque du Soleil. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I, I've read that. I've seen Cirque du Soleil everywhere. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So she wanted a Cirque kind of feeling approach to her show, so she hired Franco Dragon, who then spent eight months going around the world, and he auditioned 80,000 people for the show. The dancers. Yes. 80,000 dancers. Yes. For Celine's show. Yes. <laughs> That sounds like overkill. It, 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 well, because they weren't just they weren't just auditioning dancers. They were auditioning characters and clowns and crazy people and all these other kind of weird and wonderful creatures that you might put into a Cirque show. So, like, it was a casting call for the masses. It wasn't just about can you dance. It was about can you be a character in our show. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to find some video recording of Celine's Vegas stint because now you're... I'm going to have to, this has to come to life for me at some I'll stage. Yeah. My phone after. yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So that's how that happened. That's how I got that gig. So you were on tour and you took a break from tour to go, um, to go audition in Vegas for, for Celine. So did you know what you were even auditioning for? Like what part, or were you just put through the paces and then they tell you afterwards you can do this or fuck off? Right. It was a day long audition and it was absolutely exhausting. And they started with, of course, the cattle call and they teach everybody the first number and then they cut half the people off of that first number. Oh my God. So you can show up for an audition and be gone within an hour. Easy. Right. 
That's and terrifying. As a performer. And then they teach you the next number, and then they cut another bunch of people. But <laughs> then you have to get out there, because now it's down to probably 40 people, right? They, they've gone from about 200 to 40 people in two numbers. That's, on, okay. that's, that's stress. Right. And so you then have to not do their choreography. You have to go out and improv and show what you're made of. And improving is much harder. Much harder. Yeah. Right? Because we are so trained to not think outside the box, to only execute, especially in ballet, like you can only execute it, you know, a certain way, which is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Right? So anyway, so they had us do that, and then they had us sing on camera, and then they, like, there was just one hurdle after the next, that, and, the, and then you had to talk and interview. Like, they did everything mm -hmm. from on camera to off camera to choreography to improv. I'm singing, I mean, it was the whole thing. You think the one thing they wouldn't need you to do at a Celine Dion performance was sing, and they still tested out your vocal chops? Yeah. That doesn't seem like to make any sense. Like, Celine, that's the one thing she doesn't need help with. Yeah, well, they actually, before they, they got a group of us um, dancers who could do both, who could sing and dance. And I actually became the vocal coach for uh, the dancers because there was about... Uh, less than half of us that could actually sing. Oh, amazing. Okay. So we did that for a while. Oh, but the, the craziest thing is all of this was happening in Belgium. So once you got the gig, you were flown from wherever you were in the world to uh, La Louvière, Belgium. That was where the auditions were? No, that's where the gig was to, audi to uh, rehearse. The rehearsals were being held there. So you had to go to Vegas to audition, but then you had to go to Belgium for rehearsals yep. for this show that would eventually be back in Vegas. Correct. <laughs> this 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 world seems so foreign to me. This is wild. I'm loving this. This is like inside ballet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Amazing, and it was an amazing experience. Us being in Belgium because we were like local celebrities. Obviously, you know, just because Celine was there on occasion, we'd have people waiting outside of our rehearsal hall to see her and, and to yeah. talk to us and you know do all of this. And it was just a gig on a whole different, like I was on Oprah, you know, like it was a whole different level of gig. That's, that's, that says it right there. Yeah. I was on Oprah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, what was it like the first time you met Celine Dion? Like she's beyond like words. Yeah. I mean, how do you even comprehend that? Yeah. So she really is just what you see on TV. She's kind of very French Canadian. She has that French Canadian humor. She's kind of, you know, kooky and, you know, and uh, she's fun, but. The most interesting part was, though, was being a part of her life in her circle, in her world, and watching how she had to navigate the world. And that was kind of sad. Because it's quite hard when you get that famous. She couldn't go anywhere. She couldn't do anything. She couldn't, you know, be a normal citizen on any level. And any time she would get near, like, the general public, there would be this craziness that would take over the crowd where they would start to rush her yeah. and like it was unsafe yeah that like, had to create a lot of anxiety for her probably well you know her and i both came down with the same thing this is another part of the story that just gets crazier so you know she has um stiff person syndrome or generalized dystonia yeah i did read that yeah so her and i both came i came down with it in 2014 she came down with it a few years later and i don't know what the connection is there but I believe that, at least for me, a lot of the stress of just my life kind of led me down that neurological path, mm -hmm. which I believe that maybe has happened to her as well. Because in, in, in me having to unwind myself from that, and that's why I started studying energy work and, and all that was really to heal myself, um, you know, I just, I understand that her position in life is not necessarily a blessed one. Yeah, I think that's. I think that you can say that for all like yeah. super famous yeah. artists and no, music. I wouldn't and, want it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It would. I mean, how much money do you really need to live, right? And versus, you know, your privacy. I mean, I mean. So this was what. Excuse me. So I'm trying to like this was probably like around 2010, uh, early 2000s. I retired in 2005. Okay, so yeah. early, so this was kind of before everyone had a smartphone with a camera on it. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you could still go out and get drunk and not be on social media everywhere the next day, right? Like, yeah. I mean. Living in living in L.A. now, like you hear stories about, you know, places that people would go like on Friday nights and you would see like Leonardo DiCaprio and, and all these guys. But it was all uh, before Apple came out with a phone or and Samsung came out with a phone with a camera on it. Right. right? Yeah. Now, the, now these guys, now these guys don't go anywhere. They're just although scared. I, 
I did run into Celine at Disney once. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Well, and it was funny because I actually recognized her security detail first because obviously they were the same as when I was working with her. And uh, that was the only time I ever ran into her in public. And that was really fun to have a little mini reunion there on the <laughs> steps of Disney. That's quite sweet. That's quite sweet. So, so how long were you in Belgium training for the Vegas show? And how long did the show in Vegas last? We trained for six months in Belgium and then another three months on the stage once it was built. Mm -hmm. Right. And, so, and where, were you, where was the residency again? Which hotel? Um, it was at Caesars. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. And, the, and this, there's a specialty built stage just for her. The Coliseum was specifically built for her show. It holds 4,100 people. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the longest stages. And our stage was raked, which is actually, you know, like dancing on a hill. Oh, really? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's dangerous, isn't it? Well, it took some getting used to, that's for sure. Because when you're turning, your your foot's going like, you know, back and forth and back and forth in order to accommodate for the, the topography. Right? right. Yeah. Which is not, I mean, you could bust an ankle so easily. Yeah. Yeah. But we were still turning and flipping and jumping and everything that we could do. We just had to learn how to accommodate for dancing on a hill. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it, hopefully that worked. Yeah, it did. <laughs> we made it work. And how long was the Vegas residency? Um, she was there. We opened March of 03, and she was there through December of 07. Oh, wow. With so the show. Fresh. Yeah. 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 Incredible. Yeah. And you were there the whole time? No, I left in 2005 because I was already making a lot of money in real estate because I knew Celine was my last performing gig. I'd been trying to retire for years, but I just kept getting more jobs. But at the same time, like my body is like going, no, 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 you're in your thirties now. Like, what are we doing here with our life? Yeah. And, and you can't keep up this level of like physical intensity. Can you like, it's no gotta way. be hard no away. Right. So when I got to Vegas, we had the whole day free before we went into the theater at night to do the show. One, one show a night or two? Usually one. Okay. No, we never did two. We never did two. Uh, we did one show a night. It was 90 minutes long, four days a week. That's fantastic. That's a good schedule. You had a lot of free time. Yeah. Good gig. And we were only on maybe 35 weeks out of the year. The rest of the time we were off and they paid us when we were off. So you got a, so you got a full year salary. Celine was so generous. She was like our big mama and she would come in and, and host a dinner for us every Friday night in the theater. She'd have it catered. Oh, that's so, lovely. Yeah, so we could all have dinner together one night a week um, as a cast. That's so nice. Yeah. Like, you don't think about people doing, you know, going right. the extra mile to, like, include yeah. everyone and make people feel like a family. Yeah. But that's really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she really did. And, and how hard was it to leave that family? It was hard, but again... It was more that I had mentally moved on because during the day I was in real estate and having huge success at that. So this is yeah, Vegas real estate. Yes. Yeah. And so during the day I'm negotiating these, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of contracts. And then at 4.30 I'd leave that life and go into the theater and, you know, the director would be like, okay, kids, come on, kids, come to the theater. Come on, where are you? Kids, come here. And I'm like, uh... Uh, what? I'm I'm an adult now. <laughs> yeah, no. actually, this doesn't work for me, you know. And I know that I was one of the more senior cast members in my 30s, and most of them were in their 20s. But still, it just kind of stopped working for me on that level because they just weren't like seeing me. They weren't seeing my humanity. They weren't like caring about me. They weren't, you know what I mean. And so well, that sounds like a like an industry wide issue. Like for, once you hit your 30s, yeah, right? Like, yeah, for sure. yeah, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, but I was happy to leave. Um, I, you know, was ready to be financially satisfied instead of just artistically. <laughs> yeah, that's a. Uh, oh, I was I was chatting with someone the other day, and they had a great quote. They said, um, "At some stage, you have to stop falling on your sword for your art." Oh yeah, and and he's just like you. Sound, like you have to get up and make a fucking living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get I get that fully. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's tough. So that was the big dream after, you know, I, I'd been artistically satisfied to death. I'd done it all, right? And so leaving that, I was like, okay, now I kind of want the white picket fence. I want stability. I want a home. I want, like, all these things that I've never, as a gypsy, been able to have. And, I mean, I guess having, a, like, a real partner or a full-time partner at any of those stages in the first, like, 30, or during your professional dancing career would have been impossible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, you're moving all the time. All the time, yeah. like you really are a gypsy. You're going from gig to gig, wherever the gig is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so finding some stability, living in one city for a 
a few months or right. a few years would have been would have been wonderful. Yeah, it yeah. really was not. And just being home, like, um, well, especially when I stopped doing ballet, just being home for Christmas and not doing Nutcracker, just things like that were just like, well, I've done Nutcracker so many fucking times. My God. Yeah, yeah. Do you have like PTSD from Christmas just because of Nutcracker? Okay, so I have PTSD like from the entire dance career. Like people are like, oh, you want to go see this dance show? I'm like, no, no, I do not. I do not. It's like you visiting the war. I do not enjoy. I enjoy being a part of it, but I'm not the person who wants to go and see it now. Is it just because you're going to pick apart all the problems or is it because you literally just have flashbacks of how hard you had to train? To it's it's <laughs> both, right? <laughs> I can't go to basketball. I, I struggle going to like children's basketball games and stuff. Like uh, I have some family who have kids and things and there's some friends who have kids and they're like, oh, you used to play basketball. You got to come. And I'll just like, no, don't do that. Like, like you know, you, you and they're kids, like teenagers, right? right. Like, and, and um, you almost just like, you can't just sit and enjoy it. You either have to be on the coaching bench or just stay out of the fucking gym. Exactly. <laughs> so, so after Celine, did you stay in, did you stay in Vegas or did you move to LA? So I stayed in Vegas for a minute while I was um, kind of, I started a real estate company there, my own brokerage firm. And so I had that to deal with, but then again, it was Vegas in 08 and the whole world crashed. That's you know? right, yeah, Lehman's Brothers collapsed and the right. whole housing market mm. went up in flames. So that was when you were exiting Celine and starting your yeah. own, oh wow, good, yeah. good timing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it was uh, it was a bit of a bloodbath. And so I just kind of walked away from Vegas with the you know shirt on my back and I moved to Salt Lake City to go and get a degree in graphic design because I felt like as Gen X, I was kind of falling behind in the computer language mm -hmm. and I needed to bring myself up to speed to just be relevant in the world. Right? That's interesting. So you went from Vegas to... Salt Lake City. Yeah. Which is, that's a strange, I mean, it's close by. It's only a couple hours drive. Right. But, you know, going to Utah versus, you know, anywhere else you could have gone. Well, again, it's because Salt Lake was close and cheap. Oh, there you and go. I yeah, yeah. needed a place to kind of recuperate. And I loved that it was in the mountains. Being from Canada, it felt like home. Yeah. It felt like BC, you know. And so I, I love Vegas. Like, I love Vegas. And Utah is probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. Yeah. Like, Vegas, I mean... You, the thing about Vegas is if you live there, you don't live on the strip, right? You just, right. and, and being surrounded by the mountains and that mm -hmm. like dry desert climate, it's yeah. really lovely. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in Salt Lake for a few years, got my degree in graphic design, and then I moved to LA. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how was the, how was the, you know, going back to school and studying? Cause I guess when you were in Winnipeg at the ballet school and then, you know, that probably wasn't very academic. It was probably mostly about training. So, so, I mean, it had been what? since you were 16 since you were probably like in a real classroom i got a ged from the university of winnipeg in 19 oh my gosh when did i graduate from high school 1988 okay i was 92 i graduated no i was 97 when i graduated high school yeah yeah okay yeah so i didn't even have like a senior year because i was already performing around the world and i was going to get my ged with a bunch of adults mm-hmm yeah, and the GED is a, a high school diploma equivalency right. test that you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that you get when you can't go to school or you exactly. or you dropped out or exactly. something. Yeah, yeah. And so I didn't even really graduate high school. So going back to school as an adult was really interesting, and I really loved it. I got a 4.0. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, yeah that's I, amazing. Well, I just found it really simple. Like, people around me, I was like, I'm like, have you all worked in the world? Do you not know how anything works? <laughs> Because you would have seen so much, right? You would have been a part of so many production company, for God's sakes. Yeah. So you would have been way ahead of the game. Yeah. So it seemed really basic for me, like um, and easy. But I really enjoyed it, and I learned um, computers and graphic design and all that. And so now I can do my own, you know, web stuff. And how? How? Okay. So you leave Salt Lake City, and when does the you know when does this need to start the healing process begin with you? Because I know this is a big part of what yeah. you do now, and I can imagine being a professional dancer yeah. for twenty plus years would have left you in a mental and physical state of shambles. Yeah. Like, how did you kind of pull yourself out of that hole? Because yeah. uh, I'm I'm very curious about this. My healing journey is the biggest part of my story that I really focus on now because it's really the thing that has propelled me from a life of unhappiness and, you know, disease into a, a different state. And so how that all came about is after I left Salt Lake City, I moved to Los Angeles and became a really big real estate agent. I was the director of education for Keller Williams. I was teaching 425 agents. I was doing my own business. I was number four in the entire office out of those 425 agents. 
So I was teaching everybody. I was doing everything. I was doing my own sales. And then I got really sick. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it was just... Were you overworking or was it partying or was it just the it, body breaking down? The grind of ballet applied to real estate. I don't know if you've ever been in a real estate transaction. I, ha I have been in a real estate transaction. It's very stressful. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Especially in Los Angeles where it's very litigious as well and it can just be problematic. And so the result of me having that really big life of teaching all these agents and having a, you know, a wealthy life was uh, my health got um, sacrificed, essentially. And I wasn't paying attention to that. Um, so I was officially diagnosed with generalized dystonia uh, in 2014. Um, but it wasn't crippling until about 2018 to the point where I had to have a walker to get around the house. Um, I had to have my husband help dress and feed me. Mm -hmm. um, like I was pretty much house ridden uh, for a long time. And what, I mean, what, was that just a, a result of you being so stressed at work? Like, was it sleep? Was it drugs and alcohol? Was it, you know, were you partying or was it just like literally just the stress of work or was it some things outside of work that comes with yeah. wealth and success? It was mostly the stress of work. However, what I didn't see coming was a really big breakdown, uh, a, a mental breakdown from not having dealt with the abuse of my childhood that I just, I didn't see it coming at all. And when I had that breakdown, I mean, it took me a long time to kind of climb myself out of that because everything that had ever happened to me in terms of abuse, especially with my family, um, like I felt all, all at once because I'd never, I had stuffed it away and never felt it at all. And so when I did feel it, it was like, you know, a tsunami and it just, it totally just devastated me and just was like, uh, very life changing. So, so growing up, you you kind of packaged all that away, yeah, in the back of your brain, and and yeah, and it, and then all of a sudden, in this moment of incredible stress, and yeah, it just came right up to the surface and flattened you, right, completely. And uh, so it was a long process. Um, dystonia is in the tick world, uh, whereas a tick is kind of fast and percussive. Dystonia is slow and cramping, but it's the same area of the brain, right? Involuntary movement. Right. Yeah. No, there's a very famous musician now who has, um, who has this uh, uh, Louis Capaldi. I think his name is. He he has a tick, and it, it, they say it's like uh, he he has a documentary about it, and he walks people through about how it, it came about through stress and anxiety, and how he has to see a therapist to try to like calm it down and then when he calms down he, he doesn't have the tick and it's not so visible right but it, it can it completely overwhelmed him for years yes it's, it's terrifying yeah. yeah and so when your body starts to move involuntarily it's in the same family as parkinson's and ms right the big three of the movement disorders are parkinson's ms and dystonia right and dystonia is kind of this bucket of weirdness <laughs> they don't know where else to put it mm -hmm. <laughs> they're like oh you're moving kind of weird okay well let's call it dystonia you know, but it seems like it's been reversible because you cut, or you, it seems like you were able to heal from that. Yeah. Um, whereas maybe MS and Parkinson's is a little bit more like fatal or, or, they are. or, lo or longer term. Well, and that was the great blessing in all of it. Because mm -hmm. when I first got it, I was like, oh, I'm going to die. Like, this is how I go out. Um, but then to find out that there is, because Parkinson's and MS will kill you, dystonia mm -hmm. will not. Okay. Interesting. Right. Okay. So then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to die. Okay, well, now what do I do with that? You know, yeah, what do you do with that information now that you're, you, it's not going to kill you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so that's when I really started studying energy work um, to try and heal myself, quite frankly, because I felt like if dystonia means literally out of alignment, right? If you're dystonic, you're out of alignment. So how do you bring yourself back in line with your healthy self? That was the question yeah. that I kind of set out to answer. And it was all coupled with me dealing with my past trauma that I had never dealt with, you know, so, and COVID. <laughs> well, we can, we can get into COVID soon. I've got a few stories for you as well, but, but I'm curious, like, uh, with regards to your family childhood trauma and stuff like that, was it physical, mental abuse or all of the above? Like I, I, and, and it sounded like you were dealing with that in, as it was happening when you were 16, when you wanted to move away. Like, because you had identified, I guess, that that was already a problem and you needed to get out, right? right? So you went to Winnipeg. Right. So I felt like 
from listening to you, it felt like you had already identified that there were some serious issues there and you wanted to get away as quickly as possible. Very much so. so when you're, but now you're back in your mid thirties and now you're dealing with this all again. Right. And, and it, and it's, that would have been really hard. It was because again, the problem was that I'd never really dealt with it. And then when I was forced to deal with it, it was so big. What do, what do you mean by dealing with it? Like walk, like, again, I'm co totally ignorant of this kind of stuff. Like, right. Um, like, how did you identify that this was coming back into your life and how did you, what steps did you take to like work your way through it to the point where it wasn't debilitating? Yeah. So when I first got it, um, you know, I was just, I was just in it and sick for a long, long time. But how does one unravel themselves from that? Right. Yeah. And so that was really the question I set out to solve. And the first thing I did, not consciously, but it's been the biggest part of my healing journey was to sit down and write it all down, to write my book, to write my story, mm -hmm. to just unearth the whole thing, right? And see what's really there and take it out piece by piece and see, is it still serving me? Is this of any value? Why is this here? Is this a limiting belief that I still want to hold on to? What is this? What are my beliefs? You know, and so it was, it was me going through that whole process and writing down. And I, I strongly encourage anybody, if you have a, a, a past of trauma or abuse to actually get into it and to write it down and to take the scary stuff out of it. Like it doesn't live in me in a radioactive way anymore in the way that PTSD used to, mm -hmm. right? I used to have PTSD to the point where I was, and, and this is, I'm just going to put this out there for people who struggle with PTSD. Nobody understands it. And everybody walks around going, oh, I'm triggered. Or, ooh, you know, that was not right. I feel triggered. You, you don't understand an actual trigger. And what's the most upsetting for people with PTSD is when people are going, like, walking around, you know, you're an adult. You need to heal yourself. Your, your triggers are your responsibility, right? And you see that a lot on social media. Mm -hmm. However, you know, the, the thing about PTSD is that you can't control yourself when you get triggered in a real PTSD reaction. Right? The key signature is the inability to control oneself because you're re-experiencing the trauma. You're not having a memory. And that's the difference between memories and PTSD, right? Memories tend to fade away into the background with time. PTSD does not. So when you're re-triggered to that, you're, re -tri you're brought back to the moment of your fighting for your life. And is that, a, and is that like a, a mental or a physical state or both? Both. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Because I, I, I've spoken with some military veterans mm -hmm. uh, here on the podcast and, and, you know, there was definitely some issues of PTSD when they had come back from service and things like that. And there were things that would trigger them, you know, in their right. daily life. And the, maybe it was like some lights or something in, in their sleep or something like that. Some dreams that could maybe come back and trigger them or, yeah. or lead to a episode right. yeah. or something like that, which is so, yeah. So, but this kind of stuff happens to people every day in all walks of life. You don't have to be in the military to have right. PTSD. Right. It's just that it just, I want to put some sensitivity out there for people with real PTSD. You know, their triggers are not their responsibility. Yes, ultimately they are. However, let's allow a little bit of grace for those who we see who are the, you know, worst behaved amongst us. They're also probably the most broken, right? And their, their bad behavior is them reaching out for love. Okay. That's, yeah, that's a good way to see it. So, you know, my healing journey really started with me, like I said, I didn't know I was doing it, but writing my story down, right? Get unearthing it all to, to really take a look at it so that it wasn't living in me in an unexamined way, right? I really had to unearth it all, the yeah. whole thing. Put it on paper, it becomes real, right? Yeah. And then you can look at it and examine it and really review it and think about it. And review it to the point where you're bored with it. Like, oh, yeah, okay, that happened. Whatever. Like, let's move on. <laughs> like, you know, it only lives in you in that radioactive way when you haven't spent the time to find out the value of why that was brought to you. Did you, I mean, did you have any, did you see a therapist or a medical professional at all during any of this? Like, were you on any kind of pills or any kind of like um, antidepressants or were you just dealing with this on your own? Like, I'm very curious. Yeah, I tried to go the Western medicine route and I saw every single neuro neurologist um, on the West Coast, seriously, um, to try and find answers for myself. I did all of their pills. I did all of their regimens. The only thing I didn't do was either the deep brain stimulation or the Botox treatments. Okay. 
Um, but I did everything else and it got to the point where I just couldn't tell what was me and what was the drugs. Yeah, that's that I've heard that from people who are heavily medicated. Yeah. And they, they they it's like they're living two lives. Yeah. And and so I just had to get rid of the the brain meds at some point to just get a baseline read on where I was in life, medically speaking. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when um we moved up to the ranch where we live now, um, part of that was to really reduce our stress, right? Because uh movement disorders are often really triggered by stress. So Anyhow, when we moved up there, I stopped all of my medication and I'm just like, I'm going to just see what's me. I'm just going to see what I'm capable of right, on my own. Now, I had been seeing therapists and whatever else, but I kind of stopped seeing therapists and started chasing down my own answers, whatever felt true for me. And through the writing of these books, I had an uncle oh, who's a uh, full-blood indigenous Canadian mm -hmm. individual who raised my cousins on a reservation. And in the writing of my books, for whatever reason, they kept coming up because they were the counterculture to my Christian family that was disgrace. Oh, okay. So I, there was that kind of like, there was that kind of conflict within your immediate family. Right. So when I was over in the Christian camp, like kind of being tortured, you know, I, I always held these um, imaginings of what my cousins were going through on the reservation, right? Of what their life was like based in nature, where their spirit led was um, nature based. Right, right. Yeah. And whereas the spirit that I was being taught and preached w was not, it felt very punitive to me, especially as a young queer individual, right? Yeah. And so that would have been really hard. I mean, did you, I mean, was your father bringing home? Off of the, the teachings of the church, like was, you know, did he, did he was able to turn off after work or was it 24 seven? He is the face of, of the church and things like that. Like, so my father was very absent. My mother was that role. My mother was the, um, hellfire brimstone. Okay. That makes, yeah, yeah I'm seeing it now a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the writing of the books, these, you know, these kind of nature based spirits, individuals who I'd had in my life kept coming up as really like almost lead characters in my life when I'm writing the book, but they weren't necessarily when I was living it. Right. right? So they were somewhere in your subconscious. Yeah. And so they kept kind of leading me towards shamanism, right? Which is studying to be a shaman. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So you took that nature-based philosophy that they were growing up with and right. decided to try to explore it a little bit more. Right. Because it was known to me in a way, even if just in, as a fantasy, mm -hmm. but it was um, something that I felt comfortable with. And, you know, the writing of the books themselves was a whole journey because I, it felt like I was channeling the information because I was learning from it as it was coming out on the page from beyond me, right? But I was also chasing that because like, there's a whole process called automatic writing. I don't know if you've heard of I'm it. not familiar with that, no. It's a spiritual um, way to write that is essentially channeling. In shamanism, we do what's called being the hollow bone. So you try and remove yourself from yourself, right? You try and empty yourself to become a, a hollow vessel, the empty bone. And in removing yourself from yourself, you create a vacuum that allows to bring in the new. Right. And bringing in the new is what is the voice that's not you. And whether that's spirit or whether it's your subconscious or what, whatever you want to say it's coming from. Right? right. But at the moment I started writing, I started being directed in that way. That's really interesting. It was. And it, I mean, it was it was interesting and alarming. And and so I, I kept kind of chasing that. And it just kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger to the point where like the information that I was receiving was just coming through me like a locomotive and I couldn't turn it off and I couldn't sleep and I couldn't eat. And it was just like all of this information was just like shuttling through me 24 seven. And it was really wrecking my life, to be honest. So that's when I went to an actual shaman school. I'm like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. And so I had written my books, never having taken a class in shamanism. And I took them to uh, my editor who has his doctorate in shamanism. And I'm like, can you please explain what's happening to me? I don't understand. What, I don't understand why I'm getting this information. I don't know what this is. Is this correct? Is this garbage? What is what is this book I just wrote? Yeah. What is what is this coming through me? You're ch you're channeling something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because again, I'm talking about shamanism 
and writing a book on shamanism never having taken a course in the subject. So that was the most confusing part to me, and that's why I had to go take it to an editor who knew about shamanism, who could, in fact, verify that what I was receiving was correct. Mm -hmm. And was it? Yeah. He was totally blown away. And so him and I, we wrote a bunch of books together, um, and that's been really fun because it's a, a new skill set that I've been chasing and learning from. Again, it's the craziest process. It's like using your um, keyboard like a Ouija board, mm -hmm. right? And so I kind of just blank myself, right, from myself, and then I kind of just adopt what's called the journeying state. In shamanism, we learn through journeying in our minds. Okay. Right? Wow. And so the journeying state is an altered place in your mind that you can go to to visit other places, to receive information, to visit the whatever. It's uh, it's kind of just this altered state. And so um, when I'm writing, I just, yeah, blank myself, and I start just taking notes without thinking about what I'm writing, right? So again, I'm just being the conduit, mm -hmm. right? And so it's just, it's kind of, just whatever comes to me, but there's a certain voice of inkling, right? You understand what inkling feels like in your head, mm -hmm. right? So the voice of inkling, right, is what I kept chasing after and just listening to in the silence of, of my own mind, right? And just taking notes to what it was telling me, essentially. And the craziest part is it like, it all just unfolds in a more intelligent way than I could ever devise on my own, as an example. It will tell me in chapter three, okay, put in a bucket. Okay, and then they tripped over the bucket. Okay, whatever, bucket, whatever. And then, and then like, you know, three chapters later, it's like, oh, that's why the bucket had to be there. So you're already, you're already laying this stuff out without even really understanding why. And every time I'm, every time I write it down or listen to it and it, it, comes out in a way later in the book that's so much further intelligent than I, of my own making, feel like I could do. Mm -hmm. So your subconscious is getting getting the real work done. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. It's really fun. And uh, I, I love writing now. I mean, I, I pretty much write every day. It's just the way that I connect to myself. It's the way that I learn. Um, it's just, like I said, I, I learn from the writing as it's coming out on the page. I don't know how else to ex describe it. That's interesting. You know, um, I've, I've, I've met some people who have had trauma in their lives and used running oh, yeah. as a way of pulling themselves yeah. um, out of whatever uh, kind of sh funk that they've been in. Um, that's not really a good medical term, but the, whatever problems they were kind of dealing with in the moment. And the way you're describing your writing is, is a little bit the way that like, they would describe their running, like right. where they would kind of go into like a transient state where their subconscious would kind of flow through them where, you know, they're, they're, you know, all the issues and shit that they're dealing with in the moment kind of yeah. fades to the back and they become almost kind of meditative yeah. for several hours while they run. My main character does that in the book. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So... So timeline wise, so you you finished with C Celine in two thousand five, then you were in Salt Lake City, then you came to L.A. and did the real estate. Um, you know where were you? Where did these books come in? And where was COVID? Like where was that? How did that all kind of come together? Oh, so this is a crazy story. Okay, okay great. I got so. the right question. <laughs> <laughs> so in twenty eight, like I've always been a little bit psychic, a little bit, right? And it's okay. something I've really been trying to learn how to trust. Right, that's the biggest thing with psychic abilities is just trusting that it's true. <laughs> yeah, when you start to feel things, you're like, yeah, what is that? Is so, it even real? 2018 is when I was starting to really struggle physically, right? And we were in LA and um, just both having really big businesses. My husband had his own hair salon in Beverly Hills and I was doing real estate and we were just, you know, we were doing the best we could, even though I was getting sicker and sicker. Anyhow. Uh, 2018 rolls around and I get this premonition that there's a global event that's coming. I can't see what it is exactly, but the feeling is so massive in terms of its scope. It's going to be global. And this was 2018? 2018. 2018. Okay. So you were like a year and a half early. Yeah. So, so I, I pulled my husband aside. I said, John, we need to short the stock market. We need to, <laughs> we need to have a serious conversation about what we're doing with our lives. I know that we have talked about moving to Palm Springs for some time. Mm. Now is the time. I love Palm Springs. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like, okay. Um, so 
I, in 2018, we moved out to Palm Springs with the idea to be able to weather in place whatever was coming. Oh, so you were that preparative, like you were yeah. preparing that much yeah. where you needed to get out of LA because whatever was going to go down was right. going to be big. Right. And I knew that I wanted us to be in Palm Springs whenever the world blew up. I didn't know what that looked like, but I knew it was coming. Wow. That's, that's wild. Like that premonition is... Yeah. That's intense. We sold our LA place and we moved everything out to the desert and uh, we were there for a few years. And then um, eventually uh, during COVID, we actually moved up to the farm. Okay. Wow. So, so what was it like, you know, were you still selling real estate when COVID hit? Yeah. Okay. It's always been, uh, you know, what's been paying the bills through all these artistic pursuits and and even through the writing. Writing is very expensive expensive like uh, publishing or just writing at the time well it's it's more you know like in order to get a good editor you have to hand them ten thousand dollars just to get on their calendar mm-hmm. well 10 books later yeah. that's a lot of editing fees and publishing fees and like that's where all my extra money goes is just in getting my books published because for me it's about me putting out what I believe in, what I believe is true, which is kind of a counterpoint to what a lot of our normal culture agrees with, right? But I wanted to have another way to express really deep, intense spiritual experience without being either Christian, Mormon, or Jewish, right? Yeah, I think with, I mean, I think it's so smart to try to explain what's going on in the world without using organized religion. Right, yeah. You know, I, I've just always struggled with the you know bigotry that I've experienced in faith-based communities and I, I but I've always been a very spiritual person mm-hmm. right and so that was the the tools that I wanted to use to heal myself was through spiritual principles it's kind of like you know AA <laughs> for dystonia <laughs> yeah I mean I mean we, we joke about it lightly but like I was living in um, Shanghai China for many years 18 years actually and um, in the early days there I started to feel like, I, I, I wasn't depressed, but I was definitely struggling with, like, the size of the city, the noise, concrete jungle. Sure. There was, like, 35 million people there. Yeah. Um, and I started uh, going out with my friend, and we would go out to Tibet and go to all these places um, in western China and go hiking and climbing and, and being out in nature. So when you brought up shamanism and then when you brought up your, your cousins that grew up on the reservation and how their faith was nature-based and right. stuff like that, I really feel like in a lot of my early days... I, after my sporting career was finished, I started to kind of gravitate towards like a nature-based spirituality right. as well. Right. And then, of course, that led me into doing all this mountain climbing and right. walking across deserts for TV and stuff like that. And it's and 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 I have never been more calm, more relaxed, right. slept better, felt healthier than when I was out in the middle of nature doing right. you know what I love to do. Yeah. And and I always dreaded coming back to the city and having to deal with all the. Stress. shit and the stress is here and that always kind of brought me back down before I could go back out again right. yeah, yeah. It's, it's wild isn't it it is and when you start to hang out with indigenous people and indigenous cultures right they're just very different in their programming and wiring right they don't even have a word for like hours like I mean excuse me for mine they, they only have for hours like it's all shared ideology right there's nothing individualized about them in their world um, except for the the concept of self honor, which they take very seriously, right? Um, and I've really learned, and that's one way I've really healed myself is through exploring the concept of self honor. Interesting. Can you walk me through that a little bit more? Like, where 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 did you feel like you needed to to know to 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 bring that into your world? Right. I mean, what's not talked a lot about is when people get sick, their mental health also kind of goes in the toilet. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so when I got sick and I also got depressed and I also got like just kind of hopeless, um, it was being introduced to that concept of self honor and spending, you know, hours a day in meditation and just spending time with myself, you know, excavating my own mind to understand what's there to really review any limiting beliefs that I might still be holding on to that no longer serve me. Right. And so it's in that time of self honor and meditation where you have the opportunity to understand who you are, right? What's important to you, you know? And um, I started seeing people in, in these kind of healing sessions, shamanic healing sessions. And one thing we really do is, is go through who are you vibrationally? 
Interesting. Right? Like, how do you resonate? How do you want to resonate? Do you know how to choose how to resonate? What do you mean? Like, you know, just giving off like a, a negative vibe versus a positive vibe and, and being able to control that or have other people actually be sensitive and sensitive enough to feel it? Right. So the first thing that we would do is kind of teach people how to be sovereign, right? Sovereign from others, right? I am unto myself independent and I am not affected by you or the world. I am sovereign unto myself. Wow. Like no one does that. I mean, everyone's just watching TV and, right. and right. stuck on their mobile phones, watching everyone else do all kinds of crazy shit. No one's sovereign. Right, right. And so moving up to the farm and kind of like becoming a monk in the world to sit on my mountaintop and to watch birds for hours a day and to bless myself, right? And to spend hours a day just, you know, really looking into the energy that I'm, I'm, I'm feeding myself, right? Like the, I, the rest of the world isn't going to bless you. No, they're going to tear you down right? and so it's, stomp on you. It's kind of up to you to spend the time to do that. And we all feel beaten down because we're not spending enough time doing that for ourselves. And we're looking in the external world for something that will never satisfy you, quite frankly. Yeah, nothing outside of us can right. really satisfy us. All your personal power can only ever be self-granted. Interesting. That's a nice... Right? Nice way to look at it. So all your personal power, all your gifts, your standing in the world, your income, all of this is going to be self-granted by you for you, mm -hmm. right? And it's in taking the time to understand what do I want, like in this whole thing, because ultimately when I get to working with people, um, I really help them understand how powerful they are in that they are manifesting their entire lives. The problem is... Most people are manifesting unconsciously, right? They don't have a North Star to which all things in their life has to live in service to. Their Instagram likes. That's their North Star. I that, guess. Is, that is, right? It's like, right? How, many, how many likes does this post get? How, yeah, how many people it's, commented it's, on this? That's, that's, what, that's, all, that's driving everyone's consciousness these days. Yeah, and it's, you know, what does that at the end of the day leave you with? Yeah. Especially right. if you're comparing your stuff to everyone else's stuff, right? right. It's right. that's the that's the death of all. That's the beginning of all. It is the end. Yeah, Harrison. Yeah. yeah. So you know, the first thing we do in my practice is to help people understand how sovereign they are. That they are not attached to others. Mm -hmm. That in their life they have to get to the point where they can shut the world out. Right. How how, how much time are you spending shutting the world out? Because the world is a little crazy, right? And to create safe quiet spaces for yourself to be able to check in with yourself and to be able to understand what's going like I had to really learn how to do that after the craziness of having a big business and running around and all the money and you know and, a career, and a career in dancing yeah to just sit up at the top of the farm with myself for years ooh, that really I mean there's a there's something that happens around the two or three month mark where you're isolated on a farm Okay, walk me through this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. This sounds because in 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 theory and in practice, every I'm with you on every front. So, so, so walk me through. Walk me through what happens on month three when you've moved from the city to the farm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's disturbing to sit with yourself for that long, and you either are able to make the jump, right, to being with yourself in a quiet way, or you kind of lose your mind and sell the farm and move back to the city. Or start on drugs and alcohol in order to pass the time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people who have like um, moved to secluded places, uh -huh. uh, thinking it would be better for their. But uh, they just end up being so bored. Yeah. And they're just trying to pass time, and they right. get caught up in a lot of drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. It ends up being like not the best. So some people go up there and like they find the seclusion they're looking for, and it helps them like balance themselves. And other people need something more than than just that kind of seclusion like they need the energy they need yep. the excitement in order to feed them yeah 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 it's strange but you seem to have a, you've had a positive experience yeah but it's been a real journey with that in finding my happiness in solitude and quiet okay so so is this um is this like a is this something you need or is this a reaction to shitty people around you it's probably kind of both originally we first did it just because we wanted to um, find a healthier way to live 
without stress and to be able to provide our own food and, you know, things like that. Plus, we just had the money to be able, because where we bought was in the middle of nowhere. It was cheap. We were able to pay cash for it. So it was a financial decision and being able to not have a mortgage anymore, yeah. right, to move out to the middle of nowhere. That's a nice stress relief is yeah. right, not having to owe money. Everything we did at that point was to reduce our stress. So getting rid of the mortgage, right, we got to the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. right, all these things that you think are going to, you know, reduce your stress, some of which do, some of which don't. <laughs> well, it's great you had a partner that was up for that, right? Because yeah. a lot of people would be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do that? We have a we have a nice life in the city, you know, like exactly. you have a network, you've got friends, you've got people to go out with, you yeah. know, and to pull yourself out of that is uh, is a is a big like a family yeah. uh, decision, right? Like that's not easy for sure. Um, but my husband grew up uh, with horses, and so it felt right for him. Okay, yeah, and we we are property. We have five acres, and we have a ring and everything. We don't have a horse yet, but maybe at some point we are set up for it. Um, but that's another whole commitment. So in the meantime, we just have our ducks and our dogs. I met someone uh, the other day. Uh, sorry for this little tangent. Uh, he, he, um, she, sorry, was um, uh, teaching me about equine therapy, uh -huh. uh, horses, right? And um, and how therapeutic they can be, spending time with them, and how the way they move, the way they make decisions, the way they um, exist is actually really healing and helpful for people going through trauma as well. Because she had gone through uh, quite a few issues in her life and um she kind of brought herself back um through riding and, and spending time with horses and uh that's interesting that you know i mean if you if you're doing this you know shamanistic therapy and all this other kind of stuff and connecting yourself to the world then yeah you're probably going to end up getting a horse yeah and and it's great because all of our neighbors have five acres as well right and uh so everybody has their different animals and whatever so when we walk around the neighborhood you know, there aren't a lot of houses, but each house has its own animals and, you know, it's each farm has its own kind of experience. It's really fun. I've always wanted to, uh, I've always wanted to open up a cat sanctuary. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've, uh -huh. I've, uh, I follow some on, on Instagram where they take stray cats and they, you know, um, clean them up and, and vaccinate them. And, and then you have all these cats kind of living together and then people come and you are dealing with trauma or, or recovering from surgery or dealing with mental health problems or stuff like that and they come and they play with the cats and yep. some people can adopt the cats and stuff like that wow. i feel like it's such a peaceful yeah experience to be able to give that to people so it's, yeah. it, i get that animals have an incredible healing power i think for sure and yeah. it's something like moving to a rural location right is a completely different way of living so you're what like an hour and a half north of la we are actually an hour outside of Palm Springs. You know when Palm Springs, they have the, all those mountains, and yeah. you take the tram up to the top of the mountain, and yeah. it feels like winter up there, and it's pine trees. Yeah, I go to Morongo all the time. Yeah. I go to the casino there. That's where I live. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. At top where the tram is, but yeah. kind of on the other side of the mountain, but that, that general area. Okay, yeah. No, I, I do the 10 all the time out to my dad. Yeah. Uh, so my dad lives in Palm Springs. I didn't oh, tell okay. you that part. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so I go out to see him for dinner once in a while, and uh -huh. uh, yeah, but I know that tram, yeah. Yeah. So that's what it's like, and it's uh, cold up there. It's great. We... Uh, it's snow. It's There's snow all over those mountains. Yeah, I was there two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. That's a really nice part of the country. And the best thing about it is you get winter without like a real winter because it, it'll snow, but the snow hardly ever sticks. And, you you know, I'm an hour away from Palm Springs, so it's not the end of the world. That's beautiful. No, that sounds like a really happy place. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I take, I've taken the, um, uh, what is it, the, you take the 10 and then out to the 15 and you go up to like Joshua Tree. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, sometimes I go rock climbing in Joshua Tree oh, National nice. Park. Yeah. Um, I just, I, that place is really spectacular. You yeah. want to talk about healing energy. Right. Joshua Tree, like, go sit in Joshua Tree, find a quiet place, yeah. sit there for an hour with your own thoughts. It's yeah. amazing. It's like Sedona, but. Yeah. Oh, I love Sedona, Arizona, too. That's a good spot, too. It is. I yeah. go there sometimes because it's only about a four-hour drive from where I live. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. So, I mean. Uh, I mean, how did how did COVID feel for you getting through that professionally? You know, did you were you still doing a lot of real estate at the time? Did you take time off to focus on writing? Were you working from home? Like everyone has, um, everyone I talk to has a great COVID story, and everyone has obviously dealt with it differently. And just to set you up for this, I was um, I was living in Dubai at the time, and. Um, and, you know, there were murmurings of stuff going on in China. This was January. And I went to Russia for a bit. Uh, I was in St. Petersburg and Moscow. And then I went to Saudi Arabia for a while in January 2020. Um, and I was getting ready to do a big round of filming. And then um, I was going to start filming in February all around the world again, like I was doing in 2019, 2018, etc. And 
Um, then I went to Myanmar in February and did a nice episode. And then when I came back in March, I had planned to film in Saudi Arabia. They had canceled the filming because of COVID, even though that part of the world was still kind of open. Yeah. And then I said, well, look, I've got my crew with me. I'm just going to go to Africa because Africa will not close because of COVID. Like African, the African continent is amazing and resilient and the people are wonderful. And they just kind of like take war and disease and they just tuck I'll it under, try. they tuck it under yeah. their arm and they just keep going to work. Right. Like, and I was just like, well, if I can get out to some mountains and do some climbing and, you know, see some beautiful remote places, I can be in Africa for a couple months while this blows over. Right. Okay. So I went to Ethiopia and I was in the Simeon mountains in Northern Ethiopia along the border with South Sudan when the world closed on like March 17th, which was, and then, um, and we had to cancel filming dry, get ourselves back to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And then, um, that took about a day to get back. And then by the time we got there, like we couldn't fly anywhere because everywhere had closed. Right. Um, and even Dubai where I was a resident, a legal resident, a property owner and a business owner, they wouldn't let me go back into Dubai. They would only let passport holders go back and I'm not an Emirati passport holder. Right. right? So it's like having a green card, but not having a passport. So, um, so I ended up going to Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and spending four months there, which is not my home. Um, and it was kind of isolating and strange, um, but it was maybe better than being anywhere else because uh, it was kind of nice. But but that was kind of my COVID story. And then in, 20, in the summer of 2020, I decided to try to start filming again because I thought by the summer, this would all be over. Um, but then the world closed down again in November. And that second one was the real kicker for yeah. me because then I lost, I, like I, I, my, my company basically couldn't go forward anymore, my production company. And then I kind of lost my entire team, which were, who are all amazing. And then they all kind of got other jobs and now we're all in different places. So it's been a, it's been a rocky road and we're just now starting to get back into having a stable foothold where we can maybe start planning of, you know, a proper schedule again. Right. Cause, um, cause in 2021 and 2022 it was impossible. Yeah. And now, now 2023 and now it's starting to look like it might have a chance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. COVID for us was, uh, we were in Palm Springs at the time and we had uh, just settled and bought this amazing property on the golf course with this incredible mountain view and we just rode our bikes and we uh, drank. Yeah. Do, do you golf, by the way? No. No? You say you got a house on a golf, does your partner golf? No. No, so you guys just living the golf life but yeah. didn't care at all? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, but what was nice about it is the community had all these bike trails mm -hmm. and we did bike and so that's what we spent our time doing uh, during COVID but it's also when I was really sick and, um, you know, I was still trying to make a living doing real estate in Palm Springs and it was just kind of a mess. But so it's also really why I started writing the books is because I was afraid that I couldn't, if I couldn't do real estate anymore, what, what would I have? Right. And writing was something I knew if I wasn't, um, it's not a nine to five, like I can do it when I'm good. I don't have to wait for certain hours in order to try and perform. I can do it whenever I'm, I'm up for it. Yeah. Whenever you, whenever you feel motivated, you just sit down and, and bang out a chapter or whatever like that. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, what I was mostly doing was writing and riding my bike, just doing stuff like that. It's so it cool. seems pretty, pretty chill. My dad was in Palm Springs during COVID and he said it was pretty relaxed. Like, it, it was. yeah, like he, he, he could still go golfing every day. Oh yeah. 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 It, yeah. Was, it was pretty wide open. Yeah. Especially yeah. since it's so beautiful there most of the year. I mean, you're free to go outside and do whatever you want. So it's yeah. not like you felt like you were stuck inside. No, just the big issue was, I guess, going to the grocery store where you have to you know, mask up and deal with another 50 or hundred people all walking six feet apart. People are crazy. Yeah. Well, I was in Istanbul. And it was uh, where I found my cat and, um, I was in Istanbul and it was a city that's a city of like 30 million people. And it was the, so the government kept all their services open. The hospitals were open, the grocery stores were open and the pharmacies were open, but everything else was closed. And, um, uh, so I would like wake up every morning, go for like a long walk, uh, cause you could walk freely. So I would go like for really long walks to explore the city. Um, there was one coffee shop that I went to every single day for four months when I was there cause they were open, but for takeaway only. And I just thought like I should support a local business or, so I'd get a coffee, go for a long walk, you know, come back, you know, um, have lunch, uh, you know, and then, but then, but then for me, I didn't have, my career was moving. Like, so in 2019, I made 10 episodes of TV. So I did 10 expeditions in 10 countries 
for 10 episodes in 10 months. And I, and in between those, so we would film two weeks on, two weeks off. And in between those, I would do, I did 40 something speaking events in 2019. Wow. So, but I had to be on an airplane uh -huh. all the time. So yeah. So when 2020 hit and when I was in Istanbul, I had like nothing to do. And it was kind of nice for a bit because I was tired and, and, and it was nice to kind of like take your foot off the pedal and just sit back and relax a little bit. But then after a while, I was like, well, is, how long is this fucking going to last? Because it was like two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. And then it became months, months, right. months. And then, and, then, and then because Turkey had stayed relatively open inside Turkey, other countries were banning people from Turkey going into their country because they're like, you didn't lock down right. properly. You're a problem. You can't come to our... So I couldn't leave Turkey for a while. And, um, and yeah, it was just really hard to kind of like get back into that flow. Yeah. Yeah. It was wild. It was a wild ride. Yeah. No, I think a lot of us are still just now trying to get back. Like I said, when we first started this conversation, like we're all just still dealing with our trauma. Like you don't understand trauma when you're in it. You, it's like once you're past it, you're like, oh, that was kind of messed up and yeah. I'm still dealing with the residual. But it's ever since then, it was also good in that I was able to kind of cure myself because it really gave me the time just to focus on me, my health, my situation, my vibe, you know, all of that. Yeah, like I think that's really where I was getting at with you, and I didn't phrase the question properly. It's just like you know, was was because you were trying to de-stress your life, right? And and then COVID hit, and if you weren't financially hampered by not being able to do real estate as much as you would have liked, having that time and space might have been really helpful for your recovery. And at the end, it actually was um, because I really feel like I don't have dystonia anymore. I mean, you. I, I have a few ticks still left that I'm still trying to, you know, like get to leave my system. I haven't picked up one since you've been here. Like, right? You, yeah, you look completely healthy. Yeah. You would never know that I was like seriously crippled. Oh, wow. You know, a couple of years ago. But again, I just looked at it as a challenge. And one reason I wanted to write the book is, is because I wanted to kind of put my problems on a fictional character and kind of solve them from an arm's length transaction. Mm -hmm. And kind of like really get creative about how dystonia could in fact be my superpower. Okay. Like why is it here? What learning can be found that if I didn't have dystonia, I wouldn't have, right? So maybe if you didn't get dystonia, you would have kept on living that unhealthy life with all the stress and then you might have dropped dead by now. 100%. Yeah. So maybe that, you know, maybe getting that yeah. saved your life somehow. Right. But also, I think that people sometimes don't stop to think about all the benefits of getting sick. You're, you're right. Yeah. No, that's an interesting right. take on it. My relationship with my husband is so much closer. Like, I was dependent on him to help feed me and change me. Like, you know, like I was dependent. So our relationship is better. You know, my relationship with myself is better. We've created a more healthy life environment for ourselves, you know, and I've cured myself like since, it, you know, so there's, there's really been no downside to that journey, even though it was really hell for a long time. Yeah. Well, that's an incredibly positive story. I mean, a lot of people who were stuck at home with family members, they didn't, maybe they didn't necessarily grow together. Right. <laughs> for sure. And there's a lot of COVID divorces out there. Yeah. 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 No. And a lot of COVID babies. Yeah. Uh, people's people reaching at straws to try to make things better yeah sure let <laughs> yeah. a COVID recovery <laughs> yeah, yeah well, it wasn't easy but it's good to, it seems like you had a really positive experience yeah I did but I was also really chasing it like I was very deliberate and intentional about getting myself better because mm -hmm. I was just not going to be crippled I was not going to just have this life that I was living where I couldn't leave the house mm -hmm. you know what I mean and so I was really um, determined to find a way out of that what was it? What was it like? I mean, obviously, you were a, a um, you were a high performance athlete for like twenty plus years as a dancer. Right. What was it like losing your mobility and losing your ability to take care of yourself? That must have been really depressing. Because I, I, I mean, I, I, it's a nightmare for me to be able to lose my mobility. Like I think about it all the time because I love traveling and hiking and climbing and being outside and 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 not being able to be that free is something that um, haunts me to this day. Yeah, and again, like I said earlier, is is you don't always hear about the mental health challenges of sick people mm -hmm. because when you get sick, or you you know, like when I lost my mobility, just the ability to get around the house, right, or to drive. Yeah. Uh, when I lost all of that, yeah, you're right. It really it messes with your head, and so I got to the point where I couldn't even help myself anymore. 
right? And it was just one day at a time, just just trying to do one thing for myself that felt like a victory, right? And to keep trying on focusing on just the next rung, whatever that looked like. You know, one day it's just leaving the house for five minutes. Mm -hmm. The next day it's see if you can get yourself dressed. See if you can feed yourself. See if you can make something. You know what I mean? And it's just this small step-by-step -step process that I'm still going through of really reintegrating myself back into the working world. You know, and uh, and and you would say that that whole physical recovery that you went through is it was almost entirely uh, driven through improving your mental health. Hundred percent. That's that's wild, right? Because people think like if if you have difficulties moving your body, yeah. you must have some problem with a muscle or, an, you know, something like that. Like people don't always connect that to mental health. Right. Well, it's the same as how they cure alcoholism with a spiritual kind of approach. Right? And, and depression I've heard too. In right. some cases I've, I've, I've had some friends that have done something like that. So I, I kept going back to the fact that dystonia again means out of alignment. Dystonic movement is out of alignment. And so I was like, okay, well that's my first clue. And so I just kept finding ways to integrate myself and um, kind of remove a lot of the limiting beliefs, a lot of the stuff that I held uh, negative about myself, getting rid of negativity completely. Nothing will change your life more than that. In shamanism, we look at everything as energy, right? The energy signature of words, the energy signature of yourself, the energy signature of the president, the energy signature of whatever it is that you're looking at, all right? So I, I will look at each emotion as a, a vibration, all right? And then just kind of, and it's hard to explain without like reading my books, kind of the mental process that I went through. Um, but it really was just unearthing and excavating my entire mind and its limiting beliefs that really got me there. What What's an example of a, a limiting belief? So walk me through that, because because um, obviously you know we all have ideas that we hold dear to ourselves, and right. and which ones are hurting and which ones are right are helping us. Yeah. Ultimately, what I have discovered is that the universe is far more flexible than we've ever been taught. Right. And that who benefits from that organized religion? No. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that the matrix is quietly listening to you. Right. And that you're the guide and director for everything in your life. And so it's really just understanding and accepting that you are manifesting the whole thing. Like you're in the driver's seat. Right. And so it, it, it has to get to a point where you understand that the matrix isn't affecting you. The world isn't happening to you. Its problems are not happening to you, right? Instead, you need to walk through the world where you're affecting the matrix. It isn't affecting you, mm -hmm. right? And when you have that level of personal power, you start to manifest different. And you can manifest the whole thing, right? From your inside world to your outside world, it all listens to the same laws of manifesting. Manifesting has become more of a science now than it has, you know, a spiritual belief. And there's real steps that you can get through in order to attract anything into your life. That's interesting. So it's kind of, it's, it's almost like you're describing like some kind of victim syndrome where, right. where you feel like the world is happening right. to you all the time. And then you have to turn that around and be like, actually, I'm not the fucking victim. I'm the director. I'm writing my own story. Fuck you. I'm writing the whole thing. Sorry for all the cursing. I just throw it out there. Oh, I'm usually swearing like a sailor, so I, I'm trying to. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. But but you're absolutely right. It's abandoning victimhood. Nothing is happening to you. You're happening to it, and it's just understanding the steps of manifesting. Right. The be, do, have of the three steps of how you manifest something. You got to be it. You got to do it, and then you have it. Right? But everybody looks at manifesting and like, well, I don't have it, so it doesn't work. Well, you haven't done step one and two yet. Yeah, there's a, there's a process here, right? Yeah, like, like you don't get a PhD without doing eight years or right. 10 years of grinding work. You right. can't manifest something unless you're willing to do all the steps. Right, Yeah. right. And so that's what I teach people in my like coaching sessions and stuff like that is, is helping them understand first and foremost how powerful they are, that they're in control of directing everything they see, even others. Mm-hmm.
right? And it once you start to play in that arena, right, and start to, you know, use your mind differently, because the manifesting mindset doesn't language what it sees back to the world, right? And that's what most people do. They're like, oh, well, you know, it's rainy out today or whatever. You know, the manifesting mindset sees what could be and languages that into the present moment onto this plane. It doesn't see what is and says what is back to it, rather what could be, right? And only languaging what could be and that which you seek to bring into the now. And that's what you, you know, just focus on languaging. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So very much living in the now, you know, and keeping that positivity of what could be happening right. around you. And right. then eventually, you know, the, I really think like, I really think like the energy you put out into the world is the same energy you get back. Yeah. So if you're shitty and miserable right. and negative all the time, you're right. going to feel shitty, and miserable and negative. And right. then people around you are going to feel shitty, miserable and negative. And then that's going to be your whole life. Right. Right. And when you start to put out, when you start to vibe more positively, people pick up on it right away. Right. And then everything around you is fucking sunshine and butterflies. Yeah. And, and it's all up to you mm -hmm. to language the sunshine and butterflies into your world. I love the sunshine and butterfly. Right? Plane, yeah. I mean, if you're not calling it into this plane, mm -hmm. into your life, feeling that you are worthy of sunshine and butterflies, you're not going to get it. Yeah. I think that, yeah, you're completely right. And that's like a, it's not victim syndrome, it's imposter syndrome. Like, I don't deserve to be happy. Right. Yeah. And again, that's where I start with most of my people is helping them understand how powerful they are in affecting everything in their life, including others. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's, Let's look at the, the entire spectrum of vibration of words, right? The high vibrations being love, joy, you know, whatever like lights you up, right? That's high vibration. Unicorns. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> right? And then the low dense vibration words are the things that make you feel, you know, kind of icky and turn people off. Politics. <laughs> right? So if we take from the high vibration to the low vibration yeah. and you cut all of those words in half and you get rid of all the low dense vibration words and only use the high vibration words you can still get there. You don't have to devolve into the you know crappy stuff. You can get to wherever you're going in life using only high vibration words. When I did this for myself, the biggest change was my skin cleared up. Really? Yeah. It had just, an... just by by using different words yes. and, and changing the energy around you yep. as you were actually speaking. Yes. Yeah, I mean, have you ever seen that experiment where they, you know, imbue certain jugs of water with certain words, to, you know, and then the, the ice kind of creates a different particle depending on the vibration of the word that's associated with that picture? Oh, I haven't seen this. No. Oh, it's so fascinating. Yeah. Anyhow, it's kind of along the same lines that whatever your container or your body, right? In shamanism, we call your body your container. Whatever you're filling your container with is how you are vibing. Are you a high vibration being or are you a low dense vibration being? Mm -hmm. I can put my hands on someone and in two seconds I understand where they are in all of that and uh, help them to abandon that low dense ick, right? As soon as you get rid of all that low dense vibration stuff and you only deal in the high vibration words, I am 53. I like I started looking younger, my skin cleared up, like I it's just incredible what happens to your body when you are addressing it in that way. Mm -hmm. That's wild. It, it shifts the It's whole. a hell of a journey. It is. Yeah. I, um, I, so one of the things that you've said that really resonates with me is just being out in nature, right? Yeah. So uh, you moving to your ranch, you know, you sitting up on the hill in the evenings, watching sunsets, being around animals, you know, b uh, being around space. Yes. Having fresh air, yeah. not, not having to maybe commute or... Right. Or to deal with you know high stress work and uh, but just having that like clean air right having that silence yeah. around you yeah. like I just find that stuff so important and and um, uh, one of my favorite human beings in the world he, uh, his name is um, John Muir he's a naturalist and uh, yeah. environmentalist but he you know he was alive in the uh, late eighteen hundreds early nineteen hundreds he founded the Sierra Group mm -hmm. um, you know some of his writings and teachings was part of what propelled the U S government to build national parks right. And, and he, you know, he was always talking about how, you know, city dwellers need to go back into nature to heal themselves. Yes. And, you know, um, and spending time in nature is all about recovering from the garbage yeah. of the society that we've built and all that infiltrates us. And then we have to go back out to nature to connect with the trees, to sleep on the earth, 
right. to walk through, you know, right. to bathe in the rivers yes. and all of that energy helps kind of heal us. And I've completely lived that life where I've, where I've recognized it. And actually since COVID, I haven't been able to do it as much. And I've absolutely noticed yeah. like a, a, a drop in happiness, a drop in, um, and also a drop in my ability to, um, execute tasks. Like just the focus sometimes isn't there. I, I'm, so I'm really looking to see if like what happens when I start getting back out to doing these like long, great adventures, whether right. like how that will manifest and change what's been going through me in the last few years. Yeah. I, I honestly feel like nothing has changed me more than sleeping under the stars in a pine forest mm. for several years. Yeah. That's it. Right. It's being surrounded by that vibration while you sleep, mm -hmm. right? That changes you. And it's understanding the importance of that, how important it is that you are aware of how you're vibrating, right? And that's um, like, it's just all energy work. Mm -hmm. And again, as soon as I put my hands on somebody, I can tell whether they have that really high vibration, ear piercing kind of stress that lives in them, the kind of like chaos that's just really high pitch piercing noise, mm -hmm. right? That some people just carry with them or whether they feel like a tree Right. Yeah. And there's a real difference in that person's life based off of that, right? And how they're maintaining their container in their body and the vibration of that can't help but affect everything else in your life. It's how I've healed myself. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. You're a, you're a walking testament to your path. Well, it ultimately came from me turning myself into my own vision board my own walking vision board to walk the walk, talk the talk, change my everything, right, on my own say so. And that's the great thing about it. That's what you really learn when you get into this really studying, you know, energy work is that it's all self-granted. I think that's the, that's a huge point to make and emphasize because yeah. a lot of us, a lot of people, they want to get better. They do. But they want someone to do it to for them. them. Yeah. Well, and that's why I feel like my shamanic healing sessions have been so successful because I understand where they are versus where I'm trying to get them to. And what where I'm trying to get them to is just to turn their lights back on. Yeah. Right? Because they're stressed. They feel victimized. They feel out of control. They don't feel in charge of their... And it's all because they just don't know how to manifest their lives. And when you show them how to control the entire picture of what they're seeing... Right. And to actually get into manifesting their hopes and dreams, then they feel empowered. They're like, OK, now I, I'm in control of my life. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, I feel I feel like um, I feel like there's people out there who know. This might sound a little con uh, uh, like a conspiracy theory, but I feel like there's people out there who know. That if we feel better as a populace or as as a as a as a as a unified yeah. citizenship, yeah. that we'll you know we'll accomplish great things and maybe even yeah. you know topple governments or or make changes. Yeah. And I feel like there's so much fear and anger, especially right. here in the United States. And I've definitely felt it since I've moved here. Um, there's so much fear and anger perpetuated through media yeah. and social media yeah. um, that it's almost trying to unwind all of the good work. Of course, that we're all just trying to do on ourselves. Yeah. So it's, 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 so when you, when we talk about, um, you know, healing yourself, right. We're also talking about uh, actively fighting against everything going on in society. So let me tell you how we change it all. It will all change when we individually take responsibility for ourselves and responsibility for ourselves looks like this. It's no longer seeing the world according to your own personal directive of right versus wrong. Nobody can see that. Only you can see what's right versus wrong according to you. That's a singular point of information from a singular mind. However, the shift will happen when we stop seeing things from our own personal viewpoint of right and wrong and start adjudicating the world as loving versus toxic. That can be seen by more people. That can be seen by your neighbors in terms of who's being loving and who's being toxic. Because now we're not talking about who's a Democrat or who's a Republican. We're talking about who's being healthy. And we're talking about who's being caring. We're talking about who's being loving, right? We're not talking about, oh, well, I think that person is good and I think that person is bad. No, this person is loving. That is self-evident. We can all see it. 
this person is toxic. We can all see it, right? The proof is in the pudding. And so we're not fighting anymore. We're suddenly all in agreement with who is a loving person and who is a toxic person. You've seen so much toxicity in your life. Yeah. Through your early days, you yep. for the ballet schools, through the grind of the performance, through the people that you've had to come into. I'm sure there's stories that are horrific that you haven't even brought up today. Like, how have you, I mean, did you just come to some conclusion and just forgive all these people who treated you this way and just be like, okay, I'm going to be a loving person and you helped me on this journey and I forgive you? Or do you still, you know, do you still hold that anger or that, you know, like, in having to have dealt with so many toxic people on your journey. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what we're trying to get past is the lens of the ego, is the dynamic of good versus bad, right versus wrong, right? That whole way of adjudicating the world is what we're trying to get past. And as you evolve in your consciousness, what seems right and wrong just gets clearer and clearer and clearer. So as you're evolving, you actually feel more angry Right. Because you're like, that's not right. That's not right. This, you know, and this is crazy world. And you're just like in this place of trying to find the right, the right way. Mm -hmm. Right. And it just gets crazier and crazier until you escape the entire paradigm, until you understand that your version of right and wrong is actually what's making you unhappy. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so that we can actually evolve past that so that then we understand, okay, if that's of the ego, to move into spirit is to say there's only love, is to say you're either being a loving person in front of me in my presence or you're being a toxic person, and I will only adjudicate people by that means. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's wild. That's wild. I mean, I've seen a lot of the world. I've seen a lot of toxic things. Yeah. And uh, I've seen a lot of non-loving people out right. there. And it's just them being unawakened. And it's just us coming to them and understanding the worst behaved people in our presence are the ones who are crying out most for love, mm -hmm. right? They're the ones who are hurting. They're not bad. There's no bad guy, right? Mm -hmm. There's either people being loving or people being toxic. And the people being toxic just haven't embraced that love yet. And they need it. Yeah. And they want it. And they're asking for it, right? And so it's us. By acting out badly, they're asking. Correct. They're letting us know that right. they need a hug. Right. They do. Right. Yeah. And so it's just remembering to not go blind to the humanity of those in front of us. Right. That everybody there is worthy of the same things. It doesn't matter how they're acting. And it's going to be up to. And again, this is where the self-honor thing comes in. Right. Because how I act with you is how I act with everyone. Right. Because that's just who I am in the world. You know, and it's helping people to understand the benefit of losing their own toxicity and that's huge right first of all identifying your own toxic behavior right because in the lens of the ego when you're going that's good that's bad right you yourself are going to be good or bad right there, there's a there's a weight that comes with that judgment mm -hmm. right but to understand that love is defined as the absence of judgment right Love is defined as the absence of judgment to then adjudicate the world with the absence of judgment, right? It's existence without resistance. It's accepting what is, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? And understanding what's being delivered to you is what you're manifesting and that you don't really have problems. You're just not that good at manifesting yet. <laughs> and, in, and instead of judging people as good or bad or evil, you just uh, d d judge them as being loving or toxic. Right. And the toxic ones are the ones who you need to get in there and help the most. They're hurting. Or just avoid altogether. Or I mean, avoid. or if, if you I mean, can't. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, there's definitely people who you want to help. Right. Or who are crying out for help. And then there's definitely people who don't want help. Well, ultimately, you can't help others. That's true. And that's the one thing I've had to really learn in my shamanic healing sessions is I can provide the arena for them to heal themselves. I cannot heal them, mm -hmm. right? And I can share with them everything I've learned, but if they have no intention of getting better, right, if they're really egoically stuck in their disease, right, if they are a sick person, and that's why when I got sick, I started hanging out with those, like, support groups, and I was like, 
this is terrible. I hate these people. <laughs> and, and, and right away you were able to identify that that wasn't you. They all identified as sick. They weren't trying to get better. They were sick people. And I'm like, okay, I might have a couple problems here, but I'm not sick. I will never. I don't care what's going on with me. I am not a sick person. I'm a person who has a few special issues that I'm working through, but... You know, I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wise. Like, that's all I ever tell myself. That 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 labeling can be devastating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it can really put people down a hole, like a, like a dark, dark, put them into a dark place. Yeah. And that's why my healing sessions are so important to me, right? Because I have been there, right? I, I can walk the walk. I can share with them. I can, like, really... And it's so healing for me to help them in their personal evolution of self to abandon all of that like gross dense stuff all those limiting beliefs like i'm sick or i'm gonna get sicker or like all that's gotta go the first thing i saw or i'm a failure or i'm a loser or i'm not good enough to get what i want or the worst is when you're like you when you have something like dystonia and you're trying to do a big family event and whatever and you just can't and you have to cancel and you're always having to cancel and you're just feeling like a failure Right? Family events always make me want to cancel. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry to. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to. Sorry to throw the. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I, Some things I can still joke about. I hope. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, that's interesting. I mean, because you think about LA, you think about the city we live in, like these, the negativity, the manifestation, the, the feeling of failure. Um, all these people living here, trying to make a living, trying to make it big, trying to, you know, want to be actors right. and, and stars right. and musicians. Right. And there's so much negativity and so much imposter syndrome and so much right. victim, you know, victim syndrome. And right. it's, uh, and it's insane, like how truly sick a lot of people in this yeah. city are. Yes. Yeah. In what they're chasing and how they're chasing it. Right. Yeah. Right. And it, it, we're all looking for the same thing. We just don't quite realize it. Right. We're all going in different ways to find the same thing, which is inner peace. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't get to inner peace while striving. You can't get to inner peace while fighting, right? The first thing you have to do in order to achieve anything that feels like inner peace is drop your weapons. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. Right. So so what weapons do you drop? Negativity, you know, swearing, being upset, being angry. Being judgmental. Being judgmental, being loveless. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All of those all of those things are your weapons, your curse words, your whatever it is that you use right as your weapons in society mm -hmm. right um and so the first thing that we have to do is just understand that your personal inner peace has to come first right it's, it's sorry to interrupt it's almost like you're when you say drop your weapons yeah it's almost like you're then deciding that um you have nothing to fear correct there is that can, but that fear. But that can be really hard for people because you look around... Because they think they're powerless and they're not. Right. So they're not manifesting safety. They're not. They're also not manifesting power. Like, personal power, again, can only ever be self-granted. So if you're not spending hours a day granting that to self, granting yourself all the gifts, all the love, all the blessings, right? If you're not doing that and giving it to yourself, nobody else is going to. Like, then you're going to be walking around through the world feeling powerless, because you haven't taken the time to be powerful. And then you feel like everyone's attacking you. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's us losing our attachment to others in a way, again, being sovereign, right? So that others can't harm you. Their words can't harm you. You are sovereign from others. You are not a part of society. You are your own country, <laughs> right? Like, I do not operate by the rules of America. Right. by the rules of society, but like, unless it sits correct with my soul, right? It is literally means nothing to me. It is meaningless in my world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so where can we find your books, your teachings, everything like this? Where, where do we find you? Yeah. Well, I'm really lucky that I have a unique name. So all the handles are the same. <laughs> That's good. You didn't get anyone taking, uh, taking those names out. There was no one else. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Trying to get DaleAllenRouse.com. I was, uh, so that's, it's everything. All my handles, everything. My website, it's DaleAllenRouse.com, D-A-L-E-A-L-L-E-N-R-O-W-S-E. So DaleAllenRouse.com. I'll make sure that's in there too. Yeah. But uh, so, so what do you have planned for 2024? Because I feel like you've, 
you've gone through several cycles of rebirth and yeah. it kind of feels like you're going through one now again. So what do you, what's, what's on tap for this year? Okay. So this is the cool thing when you start studying manifesting, right? Okay. Yeah. Cause you, then you really can have like whatever you want and you understand the steps to get there. Okay. So now uh, foreign to me just had a big launch. I just became a best-selling author last week. Congratulations. Thank that's you. no joke. That's, that's wonderful. I know. So this went number one in that's men's, your camera, by the way. Yeah, yeah. men's inspirational fiction. It was number one. It, I was also number two in huge categories like LGBT fiction, right? And so my stuff all happens to live in the world of spiritual fiction is really the genre, but with gay characters, although this main character, he's more bisexual than gay. Okay. So, but this one is loosely based off of my life. This is very meaningful. The book is called Foreign to Me, and it's part of the Journey of a Dark Shaman trilogy. Book one launched last week, like I said, and went number one in men's inspirational fiction. Book two, we just released. Um, however, the launch for it is not until uh, March 12th of this year. Right. And then book three will be out the month after that. So that's that trilogy. So you just wrote a whole trilogy during COVID and now you're just launching it? Or, I mean... Yeah. And there's so much more. <laughs> and then I have this series here. But this these books here are actually being turned into a film. So the woman who runs the LA Times Festival of Books... Oh, fantastic. That's great news. Yeah. that's So again, manifesting, Yeah. right? None of this is happening by accident. This is all me using energy work and intention, right, in order to settle all this in motion. Right. So, uh, yeah, this one's being turned into a film uh, by a really important person that I'm so thrilled picked up my work and, and said it was good. So that's what's uh, coming up next is the movie script should be done um, September. And then we're sh we already have a bunch of people who want to see it oh, as potential buyers. I'm um, just based off of the strength of the books, so it's really exciting. Well, maybe when the when the movie comes out, we can get you back and we can start talking about that and, and sure. do some do some, let the put the word out. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. The, the woman who's writing the script um, lives here in L.A. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously she works for the L.A. Times, so uh, I'll be here a lot. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. You have anything else you want to talk about? Are we good? I, I think I'm good. You know, I just really appreciate you allowing me to share this, my crazy, crazy journey yeah. and kind of all the things that I now stand for. And I'm just so appreciative that the world seems ready to talk about energy work in this way, right? A spiritual energy work beyond religion, right? That is ways that we can really improve our lives with very real steps. Well, I think you said it best. Like, I think it was the first thing you said when we sat down today. It's just like, we're all just ready to move on. Yeah. Like the last couple of years have just been shit, whether you've yeah. been in the entertainment industry and you've had strikes and right. everything or whether, and then COVID, like we're all ready for a fresh, we're ready for a win. We're ready for a win. <laughs> Let's end it on that. Great to meet you, buddy. Thank you so much for swinging by. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.